Fed wants to stop if they can. A lot of companies um, are feeling that strain and will continue to do so as those rate rises. It's really still an earning story. They seem to be guiding us to a slower pace of policy. The bigger risk is for the Fed is to uh, declare a mission accomplished uh, too early. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keane, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio. Alongside Lisa Abramowitz, I'm Jonathan Farrow. Your equity market on the S&P 500 positive by 0.4%, wrapping up a central bank triple header with the BOJ shaking up the global bond market. Lisa, a tweak a tweak to yield curve control. What does this mean? I mean, honestly, what is this? Yield curve, strong suggestion. Yield curve, maybe. Yield curve, we're not sure, but we'll let you know when we actually get in there and start buying. This is basically the Bank of Japan coming out and maybe uh, conceding around the edges and easing away from yield curve control, or maybe the opposite, making it more sustainable for the longer term. So it's not a formal change in the band. It's a change in tolerance around the band. The upper ceiling, of course, 0.5%. They're not going to be rigid about that. They'll offer to buy 10-year debt every single day at 1%. So the line in the sand you'd imagine is somewhere in between. Worth pointing out the price action you see on the screen today. There was a Nikkei report with a strong suggestion this is what we'd get this morning. So you saw the bond market move in treasuries yesterday. You saw the yen move yesterday. Worth bearing that in mind. What you see in JGBs today, I would say it's pretty orderly so far. Too early to draw firm conclusions as to how this market will perceive the move from the BOJ today. Well, OK, this gives a lot of flexibility to Tons. what they're trying to do. So you're basically trying to bet against the central bank where you have uh, Chair Ueda of the Bank of Japan coming out and saying this is not a step toward normalization. Do you want to bet against that? at a time when a lot of people are saying this has to be the end of yield curve control. They're saying it's not. So how much can you really push and fight the a BOJ? The governor saying this this morning, we're still far from where we can raise short-term rates. He doesn't want that conversation right now. Go back to the inflation story. They still believe that this is an opportunity to reset longer-term inflation expectations higher. They don't think, based on what they're telling us so far, that we're yeah, they're there yet. And they also talk about the idea of inflation coming below their target in the next couple of years. This is not a Bank of Japan that is concerned about runaway inflation, which raises a question about whether they're taking an opportunity of other central banks maybe putting their rate hiking cycles on pause, that calm, to make tweaks and adjustments around this policy so that their yen is a bit more supported. Don't you think it's too early to draw firm conclusions about what we've seen overnight? based on the price action this morning? I think it's too early to understand any of this. I was reading through some of the statements by Chair Ueda. What is this? I don't understand. And also the 1% purchasing, even that. How do we understand that, given that the band, the upward limit of the band is 0.5%? We often refer to the Japanese government bond market, and you and I often chop off the last word because it's not much of a market. The BOJ owns about half of it. At least you have to consider that as well when we think about what the BOJ is going to do, what it isn't going to do. Who holds this stuff anymore? That's a great question. And to what degree are they going to keep buying? Or are they talking to three people who own them and trade them and are basically setting pricing Sometimes outside the bank? Sometimes never traded at all. <laughs> exactly. So this raises a lot of questions about the functionality. The broader impact on markets, though, is clear. And you saw that. The ripple effects yesterday with the Nikkei report highlights how the knee-jerk response is for sovereign bond yields in the developed world to go up and for equities and risk assets to go down. That's the consequence. Ten basis point move on treasuries. 10, 11, 12 on a day when we had some pretty robust American data too. I wouldn't call that a disaster, would you? It's not a disaster, but also we're getting tea leaves and we don't really know what we're getting. It's just a hint that there could be disruption. I'm not saying it's going to be Armageddon. I can save that for later in the show. OK, give it an hour, maybe 10 minutes. Wrapping up the central bank trilogy, the ECB, the Federal Reserve behind us, the BOJ as well. Your equity market is slightly positive on the S&P 500, pushing higher by about four-tenths of 1% on the S&P. Yields come lower, down by about two basis points, through 4% briefly yesterday. Your tenure this morning, 397.46. And in the FX market, Market. A bit of dollar strength recently, taking the euro back sub 110. This morning, Lisa, 109.73. Europe is very much catching my eye this morning, in particular some of the GDP reports that we got overnight and the CPI reports out of France and Spain. At 8 a.m., we got the German CPI for the month of July. Core CPI in the eurozone still stubbornly high at about 5.5%. France came in about as expected. Spain's 
inflation accelerated. Do we see a very different picture in the German economy, which is stagnating? 8.30 a.m. in the U.S., we get PCE deflator for the month of June, employment cost index for the second quarter, personal income and spending data. I am watching core PCE. The Fed watches this very closely. Do we see it come down meaningfully? And if we don't, is this data that the Fed depends on, right? We have to start asking, when does it matter? Because I'm not sure. And at 5 p.m., the Iowa GOP Lincoln Day dinner is going to be happening. This is the first time that the former President Trump and Florida Governor Ron DeSantis are expected to be in the same room. And it's kind of the kickoff to the GOP convention and all of these is that things where Tom coming is? up. That's where Tom is. He's That's where TK went. hoping for, you know, at the Iowa some GOP Lincoln Day dinner on leopard shoes. Honestly, uh, this is going to be really interesting to see, especially in light of some of the recent developments around President Trump, as well as Ron DeSantis and his campaign. Uh, you know, put those two things together and a lot of people are going to be in that room. AMH coming up a little bit later. She's in Washington. She didn't make the dinner, but she will be talking about it on this program this morning. Joining us now, Jeff Yu, Senior Market Strategist at BNY Mellon. Let's kick off the program with us, Jeff. Great to have you with us, sir. Your reaction, I Thank guess, you. first of all, to what we saw from the BOJ. What is the new line in the sand for a Japanese 10-year oh. government bond yield? Uh, well, if you look at that slide uh, that the BOJ uh, announced, you know, there's this hazy part between uh, 0.5 um, point, uh, and uh, 1%, right? Uh, so I think that's the BOJ tell telling you uh, there is no actual line in the sand, no strategic ambiguity, I guess, you know, there's some component to that. Um, but taking a step back, you know, if it's tightening and financial, uh, and tightening financial conditions that you're trying to achieve, then generating volatility in FX markets, which Governor Ueda talked about, and in fixed income markets, then job done. Every BOJ meeting is probably going to be live up ahead. And that marks a change uh, compared to the previous decade. So, Jeff, you actually believe that maybe this opens the door to taking a step towards raising interest rates next year? I, th I think everything is on the table. Um, so Governor Ueda himself admitted, you know, April, the outlook, and perhaps uh, uh, the, uh, a bit too much on the benign side. And there was a 70 basis point increase in this year's um, inflation um, outlook, um, hence a tweak. Now, you cannot phrase or you cannot you know, really characterise such a tweak in response to a higher inflation print or inflation forecast as an easing step, right? So I think the market can see that. But again, it's about the next step. Uh, we know the trajectory is towards tightening and comprehensive conditions, the phrase uh, that they're using, and uh, markets, yen, um, XP markets, and in particular, JGB's global fixed income will need to react accordingly. Has the reaction in global markets, we did see a sell-off in uh, sovereign uh, developed market bonds. We also mm -hmm. saw a sell-off in risk assets. Is that indicative of what could potentially happen, that it will be orderly, but it will be disruptive? Or do we not have any sense at all of what the response will be to true yield curve control abandonment, given that we've just heard whispers and unclear guidance? Um, all of the above, uh, really. Um, but we'll, what we do know is, you know, those um, figures that you mentioned earlier, so U.S. 10 years, you know, moving uh, much more than what the JGB uh, has um, done. One basis point in the U.S. in bonds is not equivalent to one basis point in JGB 10 years. Let's make that clear. So the more that it's going to move, um, then if you assume the process is going to be linear, then the stronger the reaction is going to be. Having said that, Japanese investors, they've been retreating from Europe for some time now. They've been retreating from the US on a relative basis. China's been retreating um, as well. So looking for new purchases, you know, for the, Euro, uh, for, for the Eurozone bond market, you know, for the US Treasury market, I think that um, has been going on uh, for some time now. So in that context, shouldn't generate too much volatility if Japan and steps back a bit more. Okay, so in other words, even if we do get full normalization, you could see it happen in an orderly fashion that won't necessarily present a tail risk or some sort of headwind to uh, sovereign bonds globally. Yeah. I think as long as the normalization itself um, from Japan, from Tokyo, is um, going to be more orderly, uh, then uh, the answer is um, yes. Um, if it's going to be sudden stepwise changes, large discrete changes of 25, 50 basis points, something like that, then it's a different story. So it takes two to tango. We have to go beyond wrapping up the last 24 hours. We've got to wrap up the last 12 months. For the last decade, we've had two anchors around the neck of the global bond market. The ECB, the BOJ, buying government bond yields, Seeing what's been happening in Germany for a long, long time, Jeff, those anchors, those anchors are away, slowly being lifted over in Japan. So I need to think about a new floor in the global bond market when it comes to yields, Jeff. How are you thinking about that now? Mm -hmm. 
Uh, well, two things there. Firstly, you said the word yourself. It's going to be slowly lifted, right? So they'll make sure that it's not going to be a volatile process, you know, as excess reserves. Um, that um, uh, that aspect of the central bank's balance sheets and continues um, to come off. They'll be monitoring that very, very quickly. But the second part of it is going to be data. And here, I think the impetus is more on the ECB or anything. Imagine previous environments. If we had German manufacturing PMIs, you know, on the 30 handle, the ECB would be talking about easing, right? So now that's where the direction of travel is. Uh, so uh, I think we have to think about, you know, who's going to stop this balance sheet unwind process. And I think that will help to serve them um, as an offset. Um, but overall, at this point, looking at all the central banks, I think uh, that markets can absorb this for now. Well, but Jeff, just to push us a little further, as we look here, question whether we're seeing the end of the rate hiking cycles for both the Fed and the ECB, which some people uh, believe is the case. We're talking about the potential abandonment of yield curve control. Where are we going to head if yields do come down? What is, to John's point, the floor that we hit that seems like the new normal at a time when some of the more unconventional policies are no longer in effect? Mm -hmm. Well, if you really want a nominal number, my rule of thumb is always, you know, where is potential growth um, on a nominal basis? So in the U.S., is it on the four handle, five handle in the eurozone? If growth is going to be close to flat, your inflation target, some two percent, is it on the two in the two to three range? Japan probably slightly lower. So that's where longer term the Wixellian rate, you know, so to speak, that really starts to come in. But to get there, we need to get inflation back to target first. And I think that is the risk. That means a lot more unwinding, more QT first before we can even start that discussion. Let's get to favorite trades in FX right now, Jeff. Which one? So you want to own APAC funders against the dollar right now. So what I mean by that, your Korean ones, your Taiwan dollars, um, even renminbi in the short term in this respect, right, because now that Japan has moved and the yen can strengthen a bit, then that gives more room for Asian central banks to tighten things or at least you know, shift towards a more assertive stance. Because you have China, Japan put together the yen renminbi, 40% in your trade weighted basket. You can't afford to let your currency strengthen. Now they are allowing a bit more tolerance for strength. So can you. And given in our iFlow data, our custodial positioning data. These currencies are quite underheld right now. Good risk reward to start buying them back. Jeff, just to be clear, that's APAC versus the US dollar? Yes, and euros and versus G10 as well. OK, Jeff, wonderful to catch up as always, buddy. Jeff, you there of BNY Mellon wrapping up the central bank and trilogy this week. Hikes from the Federal Reserve, 25 basis points. From the ECB, 25 basis points. And the BOJ was meant to be a snooze, remember that? Yeah. Then a tweet to yield curve control. As you said, Lisa, and I think as Jeff said, his phrase, strategic ambiguity, that's where we're at right now. It's up to, see, up to us to see how this market begins to perceive the move from Japan overnight because it's not that clear, at least for now. The analyst notes that I was reading, some of them were saying this is the first step to abandoning a really unsustainable policy of trying to control a market that is no longer a market and that seems completely incompatible with where inflation is. And other people are saying it was not sustainable for them to keep going. If they tweak things and allow more flexibility, they can keep going with this for even longer. Two very different sides of the same coin, which perhaps is a reason why you're seeing a bit of stasis after yesterday's concern. I should brief concern in markets when the Nikkei report came out. And let's wrap up the week. Three decisions. Which one stands out for you? I think probably the ECB, because to me that was more dovish in some ways, given the inflation picture and given their single mandate. The Bank of Japan, definitely interesting, but I can't really come to a conclusion other than there's going to be more float. With the ECB, even some of the rhetorics in, by officials afterwards has been somewhat, we don't know what we're going to do next, given the uh, slower growth pr perspective. The side-by-side -side of President Lagarde and Chairman Powell. It's the same. It was almost identical. And I went home yesterday afternoon, I was sitting there, I was just thinking, well, there's nothing identical about the underlying economies. It's a very different situation. I've said for a long time that President Lagarde has a much harder job to balance inflation with growth and financial instability potentially on the periphery. And what you've seen develop today is exactly that, some divergence with French growth picking up. Looks great, right? That's kind of what you'd like to see if the whole economy looked like that. Problem is, the whole Eurozone economy does not look like that right now. Germany is stagnating. Oh, I was thinking exactly about that this morning. How do you deal with the biggest economy in the weakest spot? How do you deal with that as a central bank, where you do see maybe inflation coming down, but it's reaccelerating in Spain, where the uh, economy is strengthening? So you look at this kind of motley picture. How do you have any conviction on how to create some sort of united policy? It has always been so much harder to come up with the right policy. One thing for the whole of the Eurozone. Jay Piloski of TPW, constructive on the rest of the world for much of this year, constructive on international equity markets. He's going to be joining us very shortly. Your equity market on the S&P 500, positive 0.4%. This is Bloomberg.
we've got to nail this inflation problem. We've got to do it now. So let, let, let's uh, let's make sure that we take the steps now necessary to indicate our firmness. At the same time, there's a bit of caution, right? The the the, the underlying uh, economic growth looks good, but they don't want to kill uh, what is well, what looks to be quite a resilient ongoing recovery in the face of higher interest rates. So they're going to calibrate things as, as they always have. It's resilient, all right. The data in America this week, stellar again. That was Bill Winters there, the standard chartered CEO. And you'd have to say, Chairman Powell must like the position he's in right now relative to the position he thought he would be in 12 months ago, looking a year out. From New York City this morning, good morning. Welcome to the program. As we close out the week and get you to the weekend, your equity market with a lift of 0.4% on the S&P 500. In the bond market, bit of a shake-up, shake-down in the last 24 hours. Treasuries dropped. Yields popped off the back of a Nikkei report suggesting the BOJ might adjust yield curve control. This morning, I guess to some extent they did. They've changed their tolerance around the ceiling on a 10-year Japanese government bond yield. It was 0.5%. And Lisa, now I guess we're going to tolerate something a little bit more above that. But it's definitely not a benefit of yield curve control, and they're definitely not going to raise rates. This, according to Chair Ueda, basically confusion. And what the market is saying is they're not going to do anything too rash, too quickly. And so you are seeing an orderly reassessment of yesterday's drama, I should say. But, you know, how much, you pointed this out, how much of yesterday's drama had to do also with strong GDP data out of the U.S., out of strong economic data that really raises questions about just how much the Fed, to your point, can really take a sigh of relief? So a bit of both in Treasuries. I'd say if you wanted the cleaner read, you could look at FX. And what that would have spoken to on any other day would have been dollar strength, and we saw some yen strength. So I think you could really see that Nikkei report start to stir up concern that we were going to get a shift. Ultimately, we have done, but I'd go back to what I've said repeatedly already this morning in the last 20 minutes, and I'll keep saying it. It's too early to draw any firm conclusions as to how this market will perceive the moves from the BOJ overnight. It will be interesting to see on various data points as they come in through the next several weeks. That'll be the real test as to where this market is going to push that perceived line in the sand. And whether Chair Ueda has lost some credibility, given that he wasn't really telegraphing this at a time when a lot of people were saying he's going to wait for the strategic review next year before he makes any significant moves. It's been a fascinating triple head of central banks this week, a hike from the Federal Reserve, a hike from the ECB, a shift in yield curve control. Maria Tadeo was at Central Bank HQ over in Brussels now in Frankfurt yesterday. Let's talk about it, Maria. The changes we saw from President Lagarde, the unwillingness to offer any forward guidance. What was your takeaway? Yeah, and, and these are significant and important changes to the European Central Bank. Like, really, we have to stress that. Just a month ago, remember, she was almost an autopilot. We got a hike, hike, hike. Inflation is too high. We have not talked about a pause. We have not even debated the idea of a pause. That was a message. And yesterday was an entirely different uh, Christine Lagarde. She talked about an open mind. The data, yes, but keep it open-minded. She said it explicitly. In September, we could hike or we could hold. And whatever they do in September, it's not some point to a sequence either. She said it could vary from meeting to meeting. So you did see a massive shift in the tone and the language from the European Central Bank yesterday from no, we're going to continue not a pilot to now it is up for play. We'll look at the data and obviously they're going to keep an eye on everything that happens from now until September. Well, let's look at the data this morning. Did you get the sense yesterday they're becoming increasingly concerned about the growth backdrop? And was that justified by the data that came in this morning? Uh, well, it depends uh, what economy you look at and, and who you ask. Uh, yes, she did talk about an outlook for the European economy that is still massively under pressure and maybe even uh, deteriorating. She also talked about the divergence between services and the industry, and that also feeds into the GDP story that we got this morning. When you look at the French economy, it was a massive, massive beat. Very good news for the French president. By the way, finally, some good news. When you look at the German economy, it's not in recession, but you don't really see material growth in that economy. So again, it it depends. The same happens for the inflation data. You have the Germans suggesting perhaps you see a cool down, but in Spain, this is a service economy. Of course, it's a summer season. People love Spain for a holiday, so you see it pick up. It really depends. But what I would stress is they're not going to make a decision based on the data that they get today. That is clear. We have two more inflation prints to come, two more core inflation prints that will happen in between this and the future decision, and they will look at it on an overall picture, also baking in their projections. Maria, just to push us a little further, are you feeling tensions between ECB members, depending on which economy they're tied to, based on the fact that some are accelerating and some are very much not? 
Yes, and uh, look, as attention, yesterday she, she pointed to a uh, unanimous decision. We did not get uh, perhaps uh, the tension that we've gotten in previous uh, decisions where it was more a question of 25 basis points or 50, and then you could really see the real tensions. I think right now there's almost a, a rethinking going on. I think it is definitely too early. They know it's a summer break. Uh, August is seen as a moment of perhaps quietness and, and just reflection and taking a time to uh, think and, and just value the medium term for the euro area. But I think overall, we were very aware that at this point, especially when you're about to reach the end, the trade-offs between inflation and the economy would become more profound. But also, even within the governing council, the assessment of this economy would become even more split. Can she maintain that unanimity? We'll have to wait and see. But for the time being, frankly, today, we have not gotten a lot of pushback to the words from Madame Lagarde yesterday. Just stay with an open mind, look at the data, and we'll figure it out come September. And what we're hearing from uh, members of the ECB, even from France, François Villeroy de Gallo coming out and saying it's unclear what the out, uh, outcome from further rate decisions will be. We've heard this tone from others around the European region. How much has the consensus been that what we saw yesterday was the last rate hike in this most aggressive rate hiking cycle for the ECB in its history? And that's a very difficult question to answer because, uh, look, this was the key question to uh, Madame Lagarde. This this was put to her in every possible way, and she did not go one way or another. I mean, she made it clear multiple times. In fact, she repeated this idea. Let me repeat again and explain. It will be about the data, the proof, and the burden of the proof is on the data. Obviously, she is a lawyer by training, so maybe there's some irony in that, too. But it was very difficult to get a sense of which way they go. Again, I think a lot of this will depend on the inflation data that we get throughout the summer. Is this a bias? No. But I think overall, what is significant, though, is that they've gone from we're not going to pause, we're not debating a pause, to now putting one on the table. That is significant in the space of a month. Maria, a really important question. If there was a 200 million euro transfer from Madrid to ah. Paris, what would happen to Parisian economic activity? I look, I don't know what would happen. I'm not even really interested in what would happen in economic activity at that point in, in either country. What I would care is that you're referring to Mbappé. He would uh, obviously become a player for Real Madrid, and we would just kill it. So am I concerned about the French economy at that point? No, not really. Maria Tadeo, thank you. Just upfront and honest and transparent <laughs> about the situation. Yeah. This is a key asset that could be transferred between two European economies. You like tweaking her about Talking this. about killing Mbappé, I could have really tweaked her. Who likes going on vacation to Spain when you can go to Italy? You know? <laughs> <laughs> why would you? you also are completely unbiased. That, that and would have be. No affiliation that's that's whatsoever. the easy way. Why would, why would anyone do that? Have you seen the temperatures in Italy? It's ridiculous. Is it hot in the summer? Tell me more. Yeah, it is hot mm. in the summer. It's record heat. And for, you can mock me for all you want, but this is something that's serious, and I'm hearing reports from people who are on vacation. Oh, they're on vacation yeah. too. Who's mm. giving you the live updates? You know, friends. Okay. It's exciting. You get a live blog of the summer. A hundred percent. And from kids. It's great. I've seen a lot of that. Yeah. I sit on the weather app. I have a look as well. See? Where is it really hot and where should I go on vacation? Does, it affect, you? But does it affect your decision? No. Because actually there's some people who are worried about Southern Europe and vacationing schedules and people not going because of how hot it's gotten. There have been entire reports about that. Yes, if it's 110 okay. degrees, people are going to be less willing to do it. Okay. Are we done with that conversation? We can move on. Okay, cool. Laura Rain of FS Investments coming up on the weather, <laughs> on summer, and whether it's going to be hot or not, and whether she's got air conditioning. In Europe, you know, my family in the south of Italy, no air conditioning in the summer. We had, is... But we had marble floors and the blinds were shut, and, you know, and most people didn't. This was a very, very working-class family, like super working-class. Grandma, granddad was in the quarries, you know, but you had these floors that meant that you didn't retain the heat in the apartment, and you got by. Well, but that's how it is in a lot of southern European countries. The problem now is if you can't reduce your heat at night to a certain level, it makes it more tenuous because nobody has air conditioning in a lot of these places. I understand it's dangerous and it can get a whole lot worse. I just think that maybe the coverage of it has been a little bit extreme over the last several weeks. I'm watching the weather. Good for you. Thanks. So am I. So am I. Futures are positive. From New York, good morning. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning. Your equity market shaping up as follows on the S&P 500. Positive by 0.4%. On the Nasdaq, up by 0.8%. Advancing, going into a big week for earnings next week. Apple and Amazon 
next Thursday. The earnings so far this week, pretty decent from the likes of Meta and Alphabet. I guess, Bramo, the one soft spot has been from Microsoft, but yeah. that was because the bar was so high. The stock so far year today has been phenomenal. And if you talk to people, they say the investment in AI, they tend to be, what, sandbagging special, that they tend to come out and over-deliver and under-promise, and so people basically shrugging off that. Anyway, otherwise incredibly strong. Equities up in the bond market were shaping up as follows. The BOJ shaking things up a little bit for you. Yields are lower today by a couple of basis points. We're down two or three to 397. Not just about the BOJ's move yesterday and the Nikkei report suggesting they might make that move, but also, as Lisa's pointed out in the last 24 hours, great data in America this time yesterday. The GDP print stronger than expected. Claims Lisa have been lower than expected repeatedly over the last couple of weeks. And there's a real reason for the shift higher in yields we've seen, not just internationally, but also domestically in America too. Which, again, is going to be really interesting to see whether this soft landing kind of narrative can continue if you do get this idea that the strength could fuel further inflation. The employment cost index later today should be interesting with that because it is one of the favorite gauges to see whether wages are going up more materially. And if that does indicate some sort of surprise not going down or acceleration that could be an issue. There are two CPI prints and two payrolls prints between the last Fed meeting on Wednesday and the next Fed meeting on September 20th. And even if Chairman Powell sounded like he might have been backing away a little bit in the news conference, you get two strong prints and it's back on. Bit of Fed speak to encourage the move, and we'll be discussing a hike again. We heard from Rich Clarida that he thinks the market is underpricing the risk of another rate hike. We heard the same from Dan Iveson from his same shop uh, in a Bloomberg News interview. There is a question here about what he wants to signal, whether he cares about disrupting the market, whether forward guidance has the same potency. And I think that is the takeaway from what we learned this week from the trifecta, that forward guidance is dead on all fronts and that every meeting is live, and that all of them are basically saying, we're not going to try to manipulate the market. Oh, Bank of Japan, it's slightly different. But uh, <laughs> otherwise, you know, we are going to take things as they come. We're data dependent. Yeah, exactly. We so promise. Like hmm. We promise. Let's finish on foreign exchange in the euro. Been a tough week for the euro again, back in a way, sub 110 briefly, 109 at the moment. We are positive there just about by 0.04%, but the data hasn't been great over the last week. The PMIs were dreadful. And a bit of divergence in Europe, stagnating in Germany and picking up in France. We'll talk about that in just a moment. Under surveillance this morning, your top headline, the BOJ rounding out the week of central bank decisions with a surprise easing of what they call yield curve control. Governor Ueda kept the target for 10-year yields at 0%, but the upper band, the ceiling, if you will, now a reference point, that was 0.5%. Governor Ueda saying this, this isn't a step towards normalisation. We're still far from where we can raise short-term interest rates and pledging to come in every day if they need to and buy 10-year yields at 1%. Bramo, it's working out what the perceived line in the sand is now in the market for this Bank of Japan. And right now, the 10-year yield over in Japan is 0.556, if you believe that it is a market and can give you any sense of where it would be traded uh, in a free uh, type of situation. It's near the highest levels going back to 2014. So if you get a sense of how long it's been since there was some sort of free float or less uh, controlled float, again, very confusing to know how quickly they'll move away and what the longer-term implications of this are. Jeff Yu of BMY Mellon was with us earlier, and I think he nailed it. A one-basis-point move in Japan is not the same as a one-basis-point move in Treasuries. If you could think about the equivalent, what's 10 basis points on a, on a JGB 10-year in the equivalent of a Treasury? Like 20, 30, 40? basis points based on certainly move. percentage basis and move. also where we've been so far fresh data out of europe showing germany exiting its winter recession in the second quarter but by stagnating hardly impressive stuff gdp unchanged from the previous three months but fell short of the 0.1 percent growth forecast by economies and this is the challenge that lagarde's got german growth is dreadful elisa French growth was OK. So if you had to set policy for France or Germany right now, maybe you'd have a different conclusion about whether we hike in September or not. And this is going to be a perpetual problem because what you do see is inflation actually accelerating in places like Spain. And we're going to get that read on CPI in Germany at 8 a.m. Eastern. Do we see a deceleration? Does this give a sense to the ECB, OK, tightening in lending conditions is working in Germany. What do you do if it's not working in Spain, in France? On the peripheral uh, regions, though, you are seeing a more accelerated contraction in bank lending. Is this going to be the transmission mechanism that you finally start to see bring down inflation? How do you balance the growth inflation backdrop at Europe and the risk of financial instability and everything in between? It's so, so difficult. Never mind for one economy. Try doing it for 
tons of economies across the Eurozone. Which is the reason why she does have a more difficult situation. I wonder if Jay Powell gave her a pass in some ways, because he was so ambiguous, she could be ambiguous, and not make anything too concrete that could rattle any feathers in any capacity. To me, at this point, this is the easy time, maybe, before sure. they have to actually start uh, countering whether they're being more aggressive in the face of weakness that's disproportionate in places like Germany. Ambiguity seems to be the word of the day for the BOJ, for the ECB, for the Federal Reserve. Ford, we've got to talk about this company, pumping the brakes on EV production and blaming, guess what, the price war for battery-powered vehicles. Ford abandoning the plans to make 2 million EVs a year by 2026, now expecting losses from EVs, Lisa, to hit $4.5 billion this year, up from an estimate of $3 billion and more than double what the company lost a year ago. We're finding out this is going to take longer and it's going to cost more money. And it comes after they cut prices repeatedly on a number of electric vehicle uh, uh, options. We saw similar types of price cuts, among others. Is this a Ford problem? Is this a broader electric vehicle problem? Is this an issue where the first mover, Tesla, has such a dominant footprint in some of the Chinese uh, electric vehicle manufacturers? Or is this a sign of what's to come, that it's not creating the promise that many people thought because of how difficult it is to both manufacture, sell at incredibly high prices, and create an infrastructure for charging? Stock is down by about 1.7%. They're the three stories we're keeping an eye on for you in the first hour of the program this morning. Joining us now is Lara Rame, Chief U.S. Economist at FS Investments. Lara, wonderful to catch up with you, as always. I think we kind of need to start with the data from yesterday because it got drowned out by that Nikkei report later on in the afternoon and drowned out this morning by the BOJ. The data in America, Lara, looks pretty decent, doesn't it? We keep sailing along. I think that is something that has caught a lot of people off guard at the beginning of the year. Um, I think, you know, there's been tremendous momentum in the consumer. The second quarter GDP report, the headline was similar, but the details actually showed a more balanced profile of growth. The consumer is still solid, but decelerated from really a rocket ship in the first quarter. And then you've also had this solid investment profile. The government's still spending. You have other areas where clearly the economy is still really got a lot of momentum. And I think that's the backdrop from which everyone's just projecting forward into the second half of the year. Lara, you correctly identified a dynamic that I don't think we've spent enough time on. Fiscal easing, government spending. Lara, where is that coming from? What is that spending on? So we've continued to see this slow drip of the infrastructure spending coming into the economy. We're, we've seen it in the CHIPS Act. We've seen it just in the fact that we've underinvested in our economy for so long that we're having to push forward with some of the infrastructure spending, some of the energy infrastructure, um, and also, uh, you know, business bricks and mortar spending has actually been surprisingly solid, despite the fact that interest rates have risen. And again, an area where we've underspent for so long. So any improvement is uh, going to be something that is notable. I think the government fiscal impulse is important because looking ahead to next year, this is one of many factors that's likely to flip to a headwind. And I think in the beginning of next year at the earliest, um, we're going to start seeing government spending really become a detractor from growth. Given that, Laura, how do you then say it's likely that the Fed will hike rates again and that markets may be overly vulnerable to this idea that the economy is resilient and that inflation may not come down as much as people think? You know, there's a lot of room between here and the beginning of the year uh, of next year when I think we're going to see the negative impulse from fiscal spending. The point about inflation is really that the base effects mean that the core inflation numbers are going to take a very long time to come down to anything remotely in a range of comfortable. Right now, the consumer data, um, a lot of data and financial conditions, frankly, are just raging ahead. And when you look at the labor market and the employment data is going to be a big piece of this, these are just not numbers that are consistent with 2% inflation. You know, we were kind of here in 2019 where we had a really tight labor market, but at that time, inflation was really not going anywhere and we had no wage inflation. We're in a very different situation now. And I think the Fed is at this tenuous point. They need to make sure inflation doesn't reignite. Look at the labor headlines we're getting this summer. We're having this moment where there's a lot more bargaining power on the cost side, this labor push side of the, the wage push side of the inflation equation.
Is it too soon to see some of this come through? In other words, could we see disinflation on a pretty steady path for the next couple of months before it rears its head again, creating a head fake for a Fed that may stop raising rates and may just hold for the time being? I think that's certainly what they're worried about. You know, over a couple of months, I don't think we're expecting any huge surprise in the inflation dynamics. Um, but I think for the from the Fed's point of view and for markets, when the Fed is in this sideways pattern and, you know, we can have a healthy debate over one more rate hike or whether they're on hold, at the end of the day, they are really fighting against markets trying to impose some kind of rate cuts or a decline in long-term yields, which are going to reignite all of these interest rate sensitive sectors. For the Fed and for markets with this sideways profile, it's very hard to find a catalyst for the next move up in equities when expectations are so strong on the economic side. Lara, just going through some of the commentary right now, PIMCO's Dan Iverson speaking to Bloomberg. If the Fed does pause and they don't go again this year, it would be dangerous to think they're done. Mike Gapen, Bank of America, we think markets continue to underestimate the likelihood of further tightening from this Federal Reserve. Lara, best guess, just to put a bow on it, was the hike this week the last hike or do you think we're open potentially for a few more? I don't want to sound like the echo chamber, but I think those of us who've been watching the Fed for a long time recognize that often they have to go more than they think they're going to have to go. And I think we're still in that boat. I think it's a really bold move, given how far we've moved the goalpost on this Fed rate hike cycle, to now sit here and confidently say they're done. I think that's too soon. Lara Rehm of FS Investments. Lara, thank you. Wonderful, as always, on the Federal Reserve looking out. When you think they're done, maybe there's more to come. Lisa, we've talked a ton about that. But one thing we can get everyone to agree on is this so-called sweet spot in the summer. Andrew Honnhorst, the city, has said the same thing. Everyone's talking about a soft landing. He'll admit the data still to come this summer may well look like a soft landing. But ultimately, there's a belief that he has, with some confidence, that later this year it won't look like that. Which is the reason why data dependency can be dangerous for some people. Because if you're dependent on data that doesn't reflect forward-looking year-over-year comparisons, do you end up with a backward looking policy. And that is the fear for a lot of people. That said, people have gotten it so wrong. And this is the reason why Laura was saying, and, and rightly so, is with a good deal of humility, we've gotten and moved the goalpost so much and gotten it so wrong for this cycle that it's hard to say right now the market's pricing less than a 40 percent chance of another rate hike in this cycle. Pain. Chairman Powell talked about pain at Jackson Hole in late August. Unemployment was three and a half percent in and around those levels. Unemployment now three and a half percent. Jobless claims are near 200 K. And if you'd asked anyone, and you're right to point out that people have been so wrong about all of this, if you'd asked anyone moments after that Jackson Hole speech from Chairman Powell, where they thought this economy would be 12 months out, there is no way that many people would have predicted the kind of data that we witnessed in this country yesterday morning. The jobless claims were pretty shocking to me. Yet another downside surprise in the number of people filing for unemployment benefits at a time where tighter credit conditions were supposedly going to restrain the economy and cause more layoffs. The opposite is happening. You're seeing signs everywhere, help wanted, which raises this, this question of what structural changes have there been post-pandemic and even just that were accelerated by the pandemic with labor shortages or uh, immigration or some of the other things that you can't create a model for in the same kind of way. Either... This economy is super resilient and it's shaking off these high rates and policy isn't sufficiently restrictive or the lags are super long, like super, super, super long. What's the difference? I mean, if it's not working, I'm, I'm with you. <laughs> I mean, there's a sense of, you. you know, this is a less interest rate sensitive economy. And Neil Dutta, the Renaissance Macro, fired up about this stuff. And Rita Sen joining us shortly of energy aspects on the commodity market from New York City. This is Bloomberg. The, the impact of the full energy crisis because of the warm winter. Gas prices, um, you know, I suppose, are no, are no longer falling. Um, and um, they are, though, in terms of storage levels, still at quite, um, quite high levels. Um, so that is important. But Eurozone consumers do seem to be more sensitive um, to the fact that other areas of inflation are still higher as well. 
Janet Henry there, the Global Chief Economist at HSBC. What's happening with the commodity market in Europe? 2023 has turned out to be so much better than we thought it would be in 2022, particularly through the winter for the likes of Europe. There was a moment there last summer when there was this real fear about Europe's ability to get through the winter and heat homes. And Lisa, it managed to do that. So when we talk about stagnation in Germany, recession through the winter, it was a mild one, let's put it that way. And relative to what we expected 12 months ago, that mild recession was so much better than what we thought it would be. And there also have been questions around understanding the dynamics of a crude market, of a natural gas market. I mean, yes, natural gas very much explained by the mild winter. But crude prices being as low as they were defied expectations of a China reopening, of robust travel seasons, of all of the use that we see around the world. So what's going on? And should it go higher? And Rita Sun was talking a lot about how it should go higher. And then it never really happened until recently. We started to see a little bit of a tick up. And Rita Sen joins us now, co-founder, head of research at Energy Aspects. And Rita, wonderful to get your input on this conversation. Lisa mentioned you there. It was the commodity rally that never really was this year off the back of China reopening. Yeah. What happened? Oh, I think there's, the China reopening probably gets uh, too many fingers pointed at it. I think Chinese oil demand has been very strong. Gasoline jet has been growing. You know, overall demand's been up about two million barrels per day. That's not been the problem. Uh, I think the problem has been that we have destocked an enormous amount of crude. And the more we go through the numbers, um, I firmly believe we've ended up, uh, you know, with a lot of oil in floating vessels without their AIS uh, transponders turned on. So they've just been absorbed gradually but definitely over the last few months, particularly in China. You know, you can see a very, very big discrepancy between what tanker tracking data shows going into China versus China's own import numbers. So a lot of these kind of shadow vessels, mostly Iranian oil, has just been seeping into the market. And I think that's kind of allowed the market uh, to absorb um, effectively more supply. And has put a cap on prices, but and it's also a function of higher interest rates, and which is something we've been highlighting, that people are just not willing to hold inventories. Now, I think you're getting to a point just outright inventory levels are very low, um, and as a result of that, you are starting to see prices move up, and this is something we'd always said is going to happen in the second half of the year, as balances tighten and as demand goes up. So I think we're finally seeing that. So you're expecting a restocking of inventories. Can you give us some kind of numbers, the kind of place you'd expect to see that in a bigger way? I don't expect to see a restocking in inventories for the simple reason that we don't, you know, we're not going to be in a low interest rate environment anytime soon. I think 5% interest rates uh, does change the dynamic quite significantly. I think you're seeing this much more in oil products. If you look at gas prices in the US, so gasoline prices, uh, diesel prices, they are roofing right now. And I think that's a function in high frequency stocks data uh, that we collect is at a record low across oil products. And I think that's the problem, that it leaves the market susceptible two spikes like we are seeing in gasoline and diesel and I think that's where I think the risk is for crude as well on average we're probably going to two to three days lower inventory forward cover because people don't want to hold inventory but that has its own risks and that's kind of the problem I think or the, the challenge for the crude market so let's just uh, frame this a little bit more clearly just so that I'm sure that I'm understanding it correctly Amrita basically money costs something now so people don't want to take that credit that opportunity cost and put it into holding physical barrels of crude, which is the reason why prices have not been exactly. higher despite the increase in demand. So what trigger could cause those prices to spike, could cause people to suddenly say, wait a second, maybe it's worth not getting five and a half percent in cash and storing oil barrels in my living room because prices uh, are going up because there is such high demand? No, so the first part is exactly right. Like, like it, it's just too expensive and therefore people don't want to hold inventory. But I think what's happening now is once you've run through that inventory, you still need crude oil to meet demand. We are very hand to mouth now. But once we've run down that inventory, what you're seeing now is refineries coming and saying demand is very strong. We need to run. Therefore, we're buying crude. That's the cycle you're seeing. My point is that if you are this hand to mouth, the risk is you need only one supply outage 
and then you start to spike like you're seeing in the products market you know you've had a lot of refinery outages and you keep seeing products spike because you just don't have that buffer in the system anymore Five days, well, five days ago, we saw U.S. gasoline prices at uh, $3.50, $3.60. Now they are $3.71. Yep. So rapidly climbing. How high could they go in your estimation based on the supply demand, demand, demand dynamics that are potentially going to underpin more increases? The good news for the consumer is that we are switching to winter gasoline very soon, and that's when the specifications are less stringent and, and gasoline prices at the pump come off. But underlying both gasoline and, and more so for diesel, uh, inventories are very low. So yes, we can actually continue to see uh, prices go higher, especially because with the heat wave in Europe and parts of the US, we've seen refineries really struggle to process crude right now. What happened to the SPR getting refilled, Bramo? Do you remember that? Yeah, it was supposed to happen. It didn't. It just yeah. didn't. It just didn't happen. Amrita, what happened with it's that? It's happening. When? It's happening. Uh, it's it's happening in, in small trickle. It's like three million barrels in August, uh, three million in September, uh, three million in October. So it's going to be a very very slow trickle. But this is the other thing, by the way. And we remember there's another loan that needs to get repaid from November 2021. That's going to be in 24. 24 million barrels going back into the SPR from that. I mean, we don't have inventories, and this is why I keep talking about the destocking. If you have very low commercial inventories to begin with, imagine taking more crude out of those commercial inventories to put back into the SPR, there is going to be more upward pressure on prices. Of course, the good news, I guess, again, from a consumer point of view is that OPEC uh, plus has the spare capacity now thanks to those voluntary cuts. So they can bring back production gradually. The, the additional voluntary bid, I'm talking about the Saudi Arabia, one million, Russia, half a million barrels per day. They can start bringing that back whenever that is required should prices go up uh, too fast. But other than that, we don't have much of a buffer. We used to joke that it was the strategic midterm reserve, but in all seriousness, do you sense that the SPR will be used politically going into the election next year, just in terms of a reluctance to rebuild it aggressively? Well, the SPR has been used politically. I mean, sure, at the start of when it was uh, released last year, everybody thought Russian production would fall a lot more. It didn't. But when it was very clear that it wasn't falling, there was no need to continue with the SPR release, right? It was very clearly driven by uh, trying to keep prices down. And that's been a very clear objective of the Biden administration uh, to, you know, be it allowing some more Iranian sales to happen quietly or Venezuelan sales. So all of that's been going on. Um, I don't think they have much more ammunition given where SPR levels are to release much more next year. But yes, I do think the pace of refills could easily slow down, again, barring those loans, because why otherwise push prices? We're already at 83. Brent uh, couldn't continue to go higher, uh, especially given demand is actually looking pretty robust everywhere. Uh, then why add to the pressure? So I'm not expecting a big uh, refilling next year anyways. I'm ready. Thank you. I'm ready to send there of energy aspects on global inventories and Oil supply right now. Brent crude, Lisa, 83.92. Bit lower today by 0.4%. On WTI, 79.85. A little bit lower by a third of 1%. To me, this is the main sleeper story that people are not talking enough about. Because if we do see gasoline prices go up significantly, not only is there a huge political question there, there also is a consumer price index component of this. How much of the declines that we've seen have been somewhat fueled, excuse the pun, by what we've seen in oil prices, energy prices coming lower? If that reverses, how much does that upend some of the gains that we've seen on a year-over-year -year basis and make people feel less well off. The gasoline price is eight-month highs. That is something to watch, not just for the economics, but the politics, the election campaign going into next year. And you raise a great point. How can they start refilling a strategic petroleum reserve at a time when there's an even greater premium around storage, where people demand more that will increase the price that much more on the margins? Uh, how can they do that if they are concerned about where gasoline prices are? At this rate, how long would it take? Six, seven, eight years? I don't know the math. To get it back to yeah, something like that. where it was. Jay Pulowski of TPW Advisory is going to join us a little bit later. The enthusiasm for the international backdrop at a time when a lot of people are becoming increasingly enthusiastic about what's been developing here stateside after some pretty strong data in America yesterday. GDP, jobless claims lower, GDP stronger. Going into the employment cost index, Lisa, a little bit later. 80% of companies have beat, albeit lowered, expectations. So you see that pretty much across the board in earnings as well. I saw that stat from Mislav Matejko at yeah. JP Morgan this morning. Compare it to Europe. Europe not getting it done.
Yeah, and you've mentioned this before. This is actually key, maybe even more than ECB policy at this moment. Equities right now on the S&P positive by 0.4% on the S&P 500. Live from New York City this morning, good morning. Stop they can. A lot of companies um, are feeling that strain and will continue to do so as those rate rises. Really still an earning story. They seem to be guiding us to a slower pace of policy. The bigger risk is for the Fed is to uh, declare a mission accomplished uh, too early. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow and Lisa Abramowitz. Let's get you to the weekend, live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio. Alongside Lisa Abramowitz, I'm Jonathan Farrow. Your equity market with a lift on the S&P 500. The earnings so far this week, pretty decent. The economic data in America, pretty stellar. And a Fed chair, Jay, Jay, Jay Powell, telling us nothing about what he may or may not do in September. The BOJ, even more, even more unclear about what they did overnight. Some yield curve control tweaks, Bramo from Governor Wader. It is shockingly stable in markets given the uncertainty and ambiguity which is new terrain for all of the central banks, in particular the Bank of Japan. And you've said this before, John, and I think that it's the right take on this, which is it is too early to say what the market's reaction is going to be to the Bank of Japan. You've said that several times and you're absolutely correct. It is too early to see whether people can truly buy into the soft landing narrative and the strategic ambiguity by all of the central banks and just be okay with it. Well, let's talk about what they've done. They've still got a target of zero. They've got a ceiling of 0.5, but they seem to allow maybe a drift above 0.5 and they're not going to address that with, what did they say, rigid, in a rigid yes, way? Yes, correct. Okay, that's the new word. And ultimately, if it gets to 1%, they'll step in every day and buy JGB 10-year yields at 1%. So where's the line in the sand now? Where's the market going to push this? We see the 10 basis point move overnight, which in Japan is a real move. Let's be clear about that. Do we push this to 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.8? Do we go all the way up to 1%? When do they start getting uncomfortable? When do they start stepping in? How much is this really dictated by the yen? How much is this trying to get the yen a bit stronger after it became one of the weakest that it's been in decades on a, a real basis, just simply because people expected them to retain these kinds of policies? These are some of the ambiguities. The bigger question has been, what impact will it have on broader markets? And Jeff, you were saying, maybe they have just shown they don't have to have that much of an impact if they do it slowly, if they do it with strategic ambiguity. Well, so far, so good. You're going to hear that phrase a lot this morning. Five days of yen strength at the moment. The dollar against the yen. Dollar yen negative by, let's call it 0.2% this morning. Let's check out the price action just briefly on the S&P 500. Equity futures positive by a third of 1% on the S&P. Yields a little bit lower by two or three basis points on a 10-year 397. As we said a few times this morning, if you aren't just tuning in, it's worth repeating. The move in treasuries yesterday off the back of the Nikkei report about what we eventually got from the BOJ this morning. So the move in treasuries, Lisa, was really yesterday and throwing some strong economic data into the mix as well. Which is a reason why uh, you're not seeing the move today. The idea that we saw the biggest move in 10-year treasuries going back to September on the heels of the Nikkei report, perhaps people reassessing today. What I'm watching in about an hour, German CPI for the month of July. To me, this could be one of the most interesting things uh, that happens, especially out of the prints out of France and Spain, uh, given the fact that Eurozone uh, inflation, core inflation, is running still very hot and about five and half percent. 8.30 a.m. in the U.S., PCE deflator for the month of June. The employment cost index for the second quarter, the key index that the Fed looks at for wage increases in personal income and spending. How much does this key inflation metric, core PCE, really start to come in, given how sticky it's been? To me, again, which data matters in this increasingly data-dependent, strategically ambiguous central bank morass that we've been thrown into this week? And at 5 p.m., Iowa GOP uh, Lincoln Day dinner happens, and it is the first time that the former President Trump and Florida Governor Ron DeSantis are expected to meet up with all the other contenders. It's going to be interesting. That'll be fun. Let's see if they're on the same stage a month from now. Yeah, exactly. In Good the question. First debate. Still don't know the answer to that, do we? And exactly what the tenor is going to be, because both of them have their issues that they can go after each other with. You know, you've got the former President Trump dealing with a whole host of legal issues, which I'm sure we'll talk about with Anne Marie. And then you have Ron DeSantis losing, what, a third of his staff and firing people, not being able to raise money. Have they left or he's cut them? I think that he's cut 
a He's number of them. people because of the budget cuts. But I, I have not spoken to them personally. I do not know. OK, we'll try and find out. Have you seen these Procter & Gamble numbers? Yeah, pretty Being good. On the top and bottom line, revenue in at plus 8%, the estimate plus 6%, EPS growth 6 to 9%. Revenue came in really strong. Lisa, EPS 137 against an estimate of 132. There's a beat here, there's a beat there, and higher prices. And it looks like, it looks like they've still got the pricing power at P&G. And the fact that margins expanded, given the fact that even though they are seeing fundamental prices come down, they can still pass along increases to pr in pricing to consumers. We've seen this from consumer-facing companies, one after another, Coca-Cola, McDonald's, now Procter & Gamble, in addition to the tech names. So at what point does this feed into the idea that maybe a soft landing isn't so perfect if you still are seeing these increases in prices and things of that nature. I mean, these are some of the things people are talking about. Have we gotten too comfortable with this idea that the Fed has won and that actually we're now going to have this immaculate disinflation? It was just delayed. It wasn't. Well, two things. Enough. One, I think you can make the observation that this is pretty impressive based on what we expected. Sure. But two, it's very different to extrapolate that out several quarters and say this is the ultimate destination and this is where we are and they can take a victory lap. It's far too soon to make those conclusions. And it's also important to realize that overall uh, sales are down somewhat and that Q2 profits for S&P 500 companies are down about 8% so far if you look at a number of different tabulations. So crossing a low bar, I think, and lowered expectations is one way of looking at it. Do you have favorite it. guests? Do you have like a top five? Yeah, of course. I've got favorite guests. Here's one now. Jay Poloski. Principal and founder of TPW Advisory. Jay, it's good to catch up, buddy, as always. Can we start in Japan, just briefly? The latest change from the BOJ. I know it's an equity market, Jay, you've been looking at more closely. Did you like what you heard this morning? Yes, um, I think uh, Japan has had success at something that they've been fighting for 40 years, John, right? Which is to get rid of deflation. And they've done that. They now have inflation. And so uh, we like Japan as an equity market. Uh, it's set up beautifully. Uh, the currency is super cheap on an OECD purchasing power parity basis, 50% undervalued. Stocks are super cheap, right? You have stocks that sell for less than cash. I think 20% of TopX sells for less than the cash that's on the balance sheet. Um, we like Japan a lot. We think uh, the BOJ is exiting yield curve control, uh, that's going to set off not only a potential allocation out of foreign assets, which is what Japan institutions have been doing for years, back into domestic um, assets, but also within the domestic asset allocation, where uh, the famous Mrs. Watanabe, the retail investor, has been doing nothing but buying bonds. Now bonds in Japan are going into the same bear market that U.S. bonds and European bonds have been in for the last, what, year and a half or so. And so that means a allocation shift to equities. And so uh, Japan is, we think, one of the most attractive markets in the world uh, at this present moment, looking out on a six to 12 month basis. Jay, just to build on that, yesterday evening, I was going through some decks, some slides from Apollo's Torsten Slock on Japanese banks and looking at net interest margins. It was shocking to see just how narrow those net interest margins are at a Japanese bank compared to, say, a Wells Fargo, which is at a multiple of that. Jay, would yeah. you play it through the Japanese banks and how much of a move have we already seen anticipating what we got this morning? Yeah, the, the banks have moved first, uh, obviously, because as rates go up, that issue that you spoke of gets, uh, gets helped out, as we've seen with uh, U.S. banks, right? Uh, you know, we've been in this extreme low rate environment. And one of our key conclusions, Lisa was talking about strategic ambiguity, brought me back to my national security days uh, studying for a master down in D.C. But we're lo they're looking to do something different. And the opportunity is to grow the economy and to have inflation uh, come back. And that helps the margins, that helps uh, earnings. And just as uh, we, we look at it in the U.S., right, high nominal growth, John, you remember we've been talking about this for ages, high nominal growth. The same thing applies in Japan, which is why you're going to have good earnings, you're going to have uh, good bank results. Uh, and again, you're not paying anything for it. Less than cash, 20 percent of the market sells for less than the cash on the balance sheet. It's a value player's dream. It's a growth player's dream. 
The currency is going to appreciate. Rates are going up. Bonds are going to sell off. People are going to buy stocks. Uh, really, it's a, it's a, I think it's a fantastic setup. To be clear, it was Jeff Yu who coined strategic ambiguity. I was just parroting a perfect explanation of uh, central banks this week. You say a value player's dream over in Japan. What about in Europe, which you have been overweight? Is there still a value player's dream in an area that has disappointed in a way that the U.S. has not? Yeah, I mean, Europe has uh, more of a challenge on the economic front, Lisa. I think that's uh, pretty clear. Um, but I think, again, the sentiment... Look, one of the things that we've been talking about is this tremendous gap between data and surveys, you know, and sentiment. And the data continues to come in pretty good, and the surveys and sentiment continues to be, uh, for the most part, you know, pretty lousy. And data is winning out. And uh, the same uh, applies in Europe. Um, you know, you talked about banks, right? John knows this. Uh, and Lisa, we've talked about it over time. We've been a buyer and an owner of European financials for the last several years, and they continue to hit new highs, uh, just hit new highs in the last uh, couple of weeks. So uh, we think the situation in Europe is better than uh, it's being portrayed. But to be clear, uh, we were bullish Europe last year. Uh, we've been bullish Japan and Asia this year. We've talked about rotation. We wrote a piece called Rotation two months ago. That's been what's going on in the markets. We have a rolling rotation. So now, looking forward, we're all about what's next, right? We want to look forward because markets are moving very, very fast. And so to us, what's next is we have clear skies. We have a manufacturing recovery. I think that's what's going to be the surprise in the second half of the year. Manufacturing is going to pick up as we restock uh, the inventory drawdowns that have taken place. You're just talking about that on the oil side. One reason why we're bullish energy is exactly that thesis. And so we think the big opportunity right now for the next 6 to 12, 18 months is in emerging market equities and commodities, both of which are at 15 to 20 year lows relative to uh, the U.S. equity market, as an example. So Lots of upside in those two segments. Do you need stimulus out of China to make that work, Jay? No. Um, we think China is, again, China's another, you know, the poster child for uh, negative sentiment. Uh, just ridiculous about how <laughs> negative people are about an economy that's a, you know, massive second biggest economy in the world that's growing at 5%, double the United States. It's growing at 5%, John, with, with, with you know, pretty much uh, an assurance. And, and they're making shifts, right? They're welcoming back the tech companies because they need them. Uh, so the whole issue around China tech is over. And one of the things we've talked about in the last couple of weeks, take some profits in U.S. big tech, reallocate back into China tech, things like K-Web, et cetera. Uh, we think emerging markets are going to lead the uh, next cycle uh, in central banks, which is rate cutting, right? We're at the end of the rate hiking cycle in the West, in the U.S., in Europe, maybe just beginning in, in Japan, fair enough. But emerging <laughs> markets are going to lead the rate cutting cycle. Yeah. Uh, and we think uh, markets like Brazil are very attractive. We like China. We like Brazil in particular within emerging markets right now. We like Japan. And then within the commodity space, we like energy. We like uh, industrials. We like precious metals. Um, Commodities, we think, are, are really the next thing. And they're breaking out. Again, within the last two weeks, WTI has broken out. Uh, Goldman Sachs Commodity Index has broken out. And that's telling you that we're not going to have a recession. So bonds priced out recession first by getting rid of the rate cut uh, for next year. Uh, or sorry, for this year, second half of this year. Then stocks with the move into cyclicals. And now commodities are pricing out recession. So you're not going to have a breakout in commodities uh, in a recession, right? Those two things don't go together. Jay, this would have been easier if we just started the interview by saying, what don't you like? <laughs> you know, this, this would have lasted 30 seconds. Jay, it's good to hear from you. We've got to let you go. <laughs> he doesn't want Jay to Jay Poloski. Go. He'll come back. Let me tell you <laughs> yeah, exactly. what I don't like you. <laughs> we get along, don't worry. 7.30 a.m., 20 minutes away. Tony Rodriguez and Nuveen on Fixed Income from New York City this morning. Good morning.
There's concerns about your Democratic colleague, Dianne Feinstein, as well. Is it time for many of these individuals potentially to step aside and make way for a new generation of leaders? Look, they'll have to make that decision themselves, but uh, members ought to be able to do their jobs. Members ought to be in a, in a place where uh, they can perform the duties and responsibilities given to them uh, by their constituents. Uh, and I'm hopeful that uh, both of those individuals make the decision based upon that criteria. Steny Hoyer there of Maryland, the Democratic congressman, speaking of Bloomberg's Anne Marie, will catch up with AMH in just a moment. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning. Plenty of feedback about Jay Pulaski and his optimism. That feedback is welcome. Your equity market on the S&P 500 positive by 0.5 percent. Yields are lower this morning by four basis points to 395.66. Taking back some of the move from yesterday, Lisa. Yields much higher, of course, off the back of stronger than expected U.S. data and a suggestion that we'd get a yield curve control shift from the BOJ. Jan, this morning, that's what we got. Haven't you been a little bit surprised that all of the strategic ambiguity, I'm going to keep cannibalizing this word, uh, this, this phrase, hasn't created more volatility, given the fact that we could be nearing the end or the beginning, and depending on which region you're in, of some very new cycle? I'm going to borrow someone else's phrase. OK. You used to get these financial stability reports from the Bank of International Settlements, and they're always pretty pretty bearish, actually, on global markets. Oh, and I know. I love reading them. Do you remember them yeah. in the old days when mm -hmm. rates were too low and... Oh, all yeah. of that good stuff. And I remember this phrase in there, an uncomfortable calm. There's an uncomfortable calm right now going through the summer. There's this belief that we can get the optimal outcome, the soft landing. That belief is not shared by everyone, but even the people who don't think that materialises thinks that the data will carry on looking that way this summer. And I think that underpins this uncomfortable calm right now. Can you really extrapolate out current conditions three months six months into next year. And it's an uncomfortable calm because it's very difficult to be bearish after being so wrong about being bearish during the first six months. And it's difficult to be bullish after the gains that you've seen. And so you just kind of sit in there waiting to understand which direction we're going in from data that may or may not show it soon enough, whether or not you believe that the year-over-year -year comps can really provide that. True yeah, read. it's far more uncomfortable if you've missed out the 40% move Whatever. in the NASDAQ 100. <laughs> Anne-Marie joins us now down in Washington, D.C., AMH, our chief Washington correspondent. Anne-Marie, you know where the conversation's been in Washington in the last 24 hours? It's an ageing Senate and more, I would say, upsetting pictures coming from Washington, this time of Dan Feinstein. Can you tell us what you're learning about the future of some of these policymakers? Well, actually, Jonathan, today in the Washington Post, the data they have is that in terms of incumbent uh, legislators in Congress, this is the oldest we have seen of a class. So, of course, there was the concerns about uh, Senate Minority Leader of the Republican side, Mitch McConnell, when he froze on camera for about 20 seconds. And then yesterday, Dianne Feinstein, who is newly back uh, in the Senate, remember she had taken some time off to recover from shingles, she seemed confused in an appropriations committee, and she looked down to start giving a speech, but really she only had a vote, I or nay, and then she was prodded to just vote, she did it, and then she was told by the senator next to her, just say I. So she was very confused, it looked like, in this moment. And then she was basically told on camera with a hot mic how to vote. So this just raises fresh concerns over whether or not these individuals at the moment are fit to do their job. Wasn't it Nikki Haley early this year who raised the proposition or at least offered the idea that perhaps we should have competency tests for people in Washington, D.C.? Yes. Also, Jonathan, when you look at some of the data in terms of the polling, many people want to see uh, term limits for these congressional leaders. Other than want, others want to see, if there's not going to be term limits for some of them, they want to see upper age limits on them. Now, we should note, a lot of Americans think if you are uh, 70s or 80s, but you have the mental capacity and you are fit to serve, then you should be able to do so. And you probably bring... Um, a great deal of knowledge. You are very wise to the legislature. But if you are not, they definitely want to see something happen where we are not in this position where individuals 
potentially are concerned or confused about where they are, and they're supposed to be legislating on the half of the American people. And we're in a much more practical uh, and near-term consideration. Mitch McConnell's uh, future is really a question mark at this point, with even some in the Republican Party wondering who could follow him as the GOP minority leader in the Senate. Some people pointing at Senator John Thune of South Dakota as the likely successor. What's the latest on that? It'll likely be an individual named John. There's about three senators with the name of John that could potentially take on this role. John Thune, John Cornyn. Um, they are likely potentially to be the next successor for uh, the senator. Obviously, anything can happen. Nothing is set in stone. But these are uh, part of his legisl uh, leadership team now on the Republican side, and they could potentially take the reins. But we should note Mitch McConnell and everyone has come out, and he's come out, talked to reporters, and he seemed fine. He's remains, he wants to remain where he is at the moment. And I thought he had a very good politically astute moment when he went back out and spoke to reporters and said, actually, the president of the United States called me, Joe Biden, and I just told him I got sandbagged. So he immediately re reminded reporters that on the other side of the aisle, there also are individuals that people are questioning about their age. And obviously, he was talking about the president who tripped over a sandbag earlier this year. Look, and this is an issue on all sides, and it's not a partisan issue. It shouldn't be a partisan issue. There's a real question about uh, just generally the composition of the legislature. There's also a question, Anne Marie, about who the leaders will be at the top of both parties if there is some sort of turnover. Does the balance move more to the fringes or does it move more to the center? Is there an idea as there is discussion about new leadership? Well, that's a great question. I think it truly depends. I mean, a lot of this depends on what congressional district you're looking at. A lot of this depends on what state you're looking at and, and the Senate race it is. And then also it comes down as well on the presidential level. Um, there's a lot of concerns as we gear up for 2024 and that November presidential election about the age of right now who would be the top candidates on both sides, the nominees, about both their age. It's not just that the, pre the president is in his 80s and at the end of a second term he'd be 86, but it's also the fact that many think the former president, Donald Trump, besides the fact is he is dealing with a tremendous amount of legal issues, uh, he is in his late 70s and many would say that he's an unhealthy man as well. So this is by and large a huge problem on both sides of the aisle. Uh, but likely, if you're going to see a new generation of leaders, potentially it goes to what many would call the boomers, I guess those in their 60s, and then much lower, 40s, 50s. And you're seeing them emerge on both sides, but they're not at the top level just yet. Can we talk about the latest indictment for the former president? Anne-Marie, what have we learned? Well, the latest indictment, Jonathan, is that the president now has fresh charges against him in the documents case. So everyone yesterday was waiting on the indictment about overturning of the 2020 election results, the January 6th indictment. Trump's lawyers were at the DOJ yesterday, but that never came. What we have are fresh charges when it comes to the documents case that's being prosecuted now outside the Southern District of Florida. And this is two issues in this case, this latest doc indictment charges. One is that Trump wanted to amend to get rid of surveillance footage. And there's a third defendant that is charged in this case as well, another worker at Mar-a-Lago. The second is that he wanted to conceal a willful retention of national security documents. Now, remember, there was a leaked audio about this and a conversation in Bedminster, his golf course in New Jersey, about a very sensitive document about the U.S. potential military plan in another country. These are the two latest charges in that same case in Florida. And this is the documents case. What a bizarre time it is down in Washington. Anne-Marie, thank you. MH in Washington, D.C. on the latest. If you are just tuning in, welcome to the program. As we get you towards the weekend, your equity market with a lift, 0.5 percent higher on the S&P 500. This from Apollo and Torsten Slock this morning. In sum, for markets to continue to trade higher, the soft landing must be a soft landing not a reacceleration, because if housing and consumer spending accelerate from here, the Fed will have to raise rates a lot more. That just in from Torsten. We'll pick up on that in a moment. Tony Rodriguez, a new thing, up next.
Equities with a lift this Friday morning. Good morning to you. Going towards the weekend with equities positive on the S&P 500 by 0.5%. On the Nasdaq up by 0.9%. The Nasdaq has looked pretty good, hasn't it, all year. It's been backed up by the earnings we've had so far this week from Google. From Facebook, the Russell of small caps positive too by 0.55%. In the bond market, two-year, 10-year, 30-year. Yesterday, Treasuries lower, the data pretty decent. This morning, Treasuries rally, yields are lower by four basis points, 395.66 on a two-year down six basis points to 486.82. Two CPI prints between now and the next meeting, the first one August 10th. The next one, September 13th. The next Federal Reserve meeting, September 20th. And Jackson Hole, back end of August, I believe, 24th to 26th of August. Unclear. Always is, Lisa. We often talk about this. Chairman Powell's going to deliver a speech. I mean, he might do. It's unclear as to whether he will do. What are you saying? And you made the suggestion yesterday, too. Maybe he just doesn't show Maybe up. Maybe he won't. Maybe he just takes August off. I mean, strategic ambiguity is strategic absence as well. Exactly. Hello, summer. Exa Hello, summer. Mm. Take a break. After the financial crisis, there became this almost expectation that we would always get the speech from the Federal Reserve Chair at Jackson Hole. We probably will. I'm just saying, you know, maybe we won't. And maybe it'll be six minutes. Maybe it'll be four minutes. I think the issue is, if he does give a speech, what can he say if he basically said nothing at the press conference by design, if he's herding cats of different philosophies economically and looking at data that could tell you five different stories, depending on how you wanted to read it? And by herding cats, you mean the people on the committee Correct. right now yes. on the FOMC, exactly. yes. given the difference in views mm -hmm. at the Federal Reserve at the moment. Chairman Powell expected to deliver a speech at Jackson Hole. We'll see if he does or doesn't. Mike McKeel will be the first one to tell us, no doubt. Let's turn to foreign exchange, to the euro. The euro this morning just in and around 110, 110, 14, turning positive in the last, I would say, 20 minutes or so. We're positive there by a third of 1%. Under surveillance this morning, your top story, the BOJ rounding out the week of central bank decisions with a surprise easing of what they call in Japan yield curve control. The governor of the Bank of Japan keeping the target for the 10-year yield at around 0%, but this 0.5% ceiling is now being called a reference point and not a rigid limit. Read between the lines. The governor saying this, this isn't a step towards normalisation. We're still far from where we can raise short-term interest rates. So clearly, we don't want to talk about raising rates, Bramo, but ultimately, there's a shift in the tolerance around the ceiling for a 10-year yield in Japan. When we got the rumour of some shift yesterday from the Nikkei reporting, the market was concerned, and you could feel this. It was a pretty significant hold up. What do you mean? Nobody's expecting this. What are you going to say? And then he comes out and he says, I don't know, what did he say? He said, basically, we're not doing something, but we are, and, you know, we're not, we are always going to be data dependent. Uh, and here we are with relative calm. And to me, how much freedom does that give them to move further, to make further adjustments, given the calm that we've seen certainly today? Huge if, and I know we're both on the same page, if it continues. Sure. If that calm continues, and so far, so good. In Europe, fresh data out of the Eurozone showing Germany just about exited this winter recession it's been in for the last couple of quarters. Output stagnated. So that's the win. The good news, they're no longer in recession. The bad news is that output stagnated. GDP unchanged for the previous three months. We were hoping, can I say hope? Lisa, this is what hope is in Europe for Germany at the moment. We were hoping for 0.1% growth, according to estimates. We still have projections by global bodies that Germany will be the only developed economy that will be in recession this year. They are expected to be in recession for the full year at a time when previously it was thought they hinged on exports that go over to China. Is this still a China story or is there something else going on structurally with the biggest economy in Europe that creates a real challenge, especially with monetary policy, but also for the overall getting out of inflation without stagflation that really could be pernicious? It's a struggle. So that's the latest from Europe. Here's the latest from P&G, Procter & Gamble. What do you do if volume is down how do you achieve revenue growth? Well, you put prices up, don't you? And that's what they've been doing. And they've got the pricing power to do it. Let's be clear about it. P&G this morning up by 1.7%. We've seen it from Procter & Gamble. Lisa, beat on the top and bottom line from P&G this morning. And pricing power is back. And it looks like the consumer is still tolerating it. Have you ever bought Tide Pods? 
I've got Tide Pods, yeah, yeah. yeah. Me too. They're pretty expensive. And actually, if you go into... You don't do them on Prime Day. Do them on Prime Day. <laughs> you, wait, you Find load up? Where do you I've... store them? In New York City apartments? Where do you store them? We've got storage. You've got storage. We've okay, got storage. well, I will just say that in the local uh, drugstore, they're locked up now currently because they are that valuable and the Tide Pods are pretty expensive. My point here is they do have pricing power and you see gross margins increasing, especially as input prices come down. So... They aren't having to spend as much to make said Tide Pods, but they still cost. I have the luxury of having the washing machine and dryer in the apartment, which is I know is a luxury for Manhattan. If you're sitting here in the United Kingdom or elsewhere, yes, truly, that is a luxury for a, a New York apartment to have a washing machine and a dryer in the apartment. And then I pile up the Tide Pods down the side in that little cupboard thing. Just <laughs> That's so you in don't, character. You don't buy them in bulk. Perfectly. I do yeah. buy them in bulk, but you so you just have them like stacked up perfectly. Individually, Individually. take out the pods and just put them. No, of course it's like I don't. Building blocks. Bramo, stop it. Tony Rodriguez joins us now. Head of fixed income strategy over at Nuveen. Tony, we're not going to talk about Tide. We'll talk about the BOJ. What have we just unleashed? at the Bank of Japan this morning. Well, good morning, Jonathan. Good to be with you. Uh, so I think with the BOJ, you know, the market's surprised by a bit. I think everyone expected that yield curve control would be addressed probably more in the fall. So they may be done it a bit early, but they certainly did it in a bit of an ambiguous way with putting maybe this, you know, 1% ceiling, but it's a reference rate at 50. Our view is that 10-year JGBs, probably fair value, are in the 75 to 85 basis point area. So we think that 1% ceiling is one that wouldn't be hit anyway if they completely loosen yield curve control. So I think this is a small step ultimately in the direction of having a firm ceiling probably at 1%. But given the conditions of the Japanese economy, although inflation is certainly, you know, stronger now than it's been any time in the last 30 to 40 years in Japan, we don't think it's going to be at elevated enough levels and growth will not be significantly strong enough to really drive 10-year JGB yields significantly higher than where we are right now. It's only 25 basis points in a place like Japan and the Japanese government bond market isn't nothing, it's something. Can you tell me how you'd expect domestic investors to reallocate away from international stories, perhaps bringing money back home? I think you're going to see a modest amount of reallocation. But at the end of the day, you know, you're still seeing significantly higher yields abroad as long as hedging costs eventually begin to decline because those have been quite stubborn. We've seen hedging costs for the euro decline pretty dramatically from peaks that we saw last year, whereas yen hedging costs have stayed very high. If those begin to ease, I think, again, you will see some reallocation, but we don't think it's going to be seismic by any means. So ultimately, it's going to be about, hey, what's the best total return value you can find across broad capital markets for a yen-based investor? And in that equation, we still think areas outside of Japan are going to remain pretty attractive for the Japanese investor. Taking a step back, the era of forward guidance seemed to have died this week, both from the Fed and the ECB, and at some levels, the Bank of Japan as well. Where does that leave you? How does that shift your view going out about a gradual move lower in U.S. yields and just a gradual lean into duration? Well, you know, Lisa, it's tough to have forward guidance when you don't have any idea where things are going. And certainly, uh, central banks have had difficulty forecasting where we're heading. From our perspective, really the key driver about where monetary policy is going, uh, certainly in the U.S., but also abroad, is obviously the inflation metrics and the uh, underlying economic strength. And from that perspective, we do think you're going to continue to see improvement on the inflation story, but not significant enough improvement that's going to allow central banks to say mission accomplished. The big issue is on the growth side. And while growth has surprised to the upside uh, in the U.S. and kind of globally, we would argue, we think that's just merely a delay in what's ultimately going to be slowing economic growth. If we take the U.S. as an example, it's certainly been more resilient, whether it's because of the you know, CHIPS Act and infrastructure spending on the fiscal side, whether it's because of the consumer being more resilient due to a very strong labor market and excess savings. As we look forward, we think that those excess savings are basically spent. You're hearing that from many of the banks in their earnings calls, that consumer balances are back to where we were pre-pandemic. So that will no longer be a support. The, when you look at the manufacturing sector, we're seeing some modest slowing there. So our view is that you're going to see a slowdown in the second half, ultimately potentially a very mild recession, 
early in 2024. So it may look like a soft landing or feel like a soft landing in terms of not seeing a significant rising unemployment rate, but it will be enough economic weakness to allow market yields to decline from where we are today, both in the U.S. and we think abroad. How have you shifted your stance as the economic data has come in stronger than expected, given that so many people are pushing out their expectations for recession, if we even get one? Yeah, so the big shift that we've seen really is that we've grown much more comfortable with duration risk. Anytime we see the 10-year above 4%, we think that's an attractive area to add duration to portfolios. We ultimately think high-quality duration is going to be a very good hedge if, in case, we're wrong, and it's a more severe downturn than just a mild recession slash soft landing next year. That long, high-quality duration is going to be really a, a very attractive hedge versus risk assets. At the same time, as we sit here this summer, given where risk premiums have gone, spreads have tightened, the attractiveness of the credit sectors has certainly declined a bit. So we are actually kind of reducing our exposure there, thinking that there'll be some better entry points as we move through the year. So we're moving closer to what we would call the midpoint of our risk budget here and staying up in quality to reflect that slowing in economic, in economic growth that we're expecting, some increase in defaults as we move through the balance of this year um, in our portfolios. Interesting. Tony, thank you, sir. Tony Rodriguez there of Nuveen on the credit market. I had this conversation with Peter Cheer yesterday, and I wish Pete was on a panel with Tony because Peter Cheer thinks we're in the summer sweet spot thinks the juice is worth the squeeze, maybe take on a little bit more risk through the rest of this summer. And there you've got Tony Rodriguez talking about the same sweet spot, but ultimately using it as an opportunity to trim risk and prepare for opportunities later this year. Get the uh, outcome right and you'll still get two different trades. And I think that's a great way of putting just the uncertainty, not only in what's going to happen, but how you play it out through markets that have really defied logic in some capacities, or at least traditional. So. How do you feel about the BOJ this morning? Starting gun on tightening or just making easing more sustainable? Both, right? Because they're making easing more sustainable by relaxing their hold just a bit. How much of what we saw from the Fed and the ECB gave them the license to do this? Because you had a less aggressive policy there, it would be less disruptive for them to make some sort of shift. And maybe that's why they saw an opening this week. If they made the move when government bonds were selling off aggressively exactly. and the tightening cycles exactly. had just started from the ECB and the Fed. It's an interesting point. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning. Welcome to the program on the S&P 500. We are positive by 0.5%. Coming up a little bit later, 8.30 a.m. Eastern time. So about 40 minutes from now, Jonathan Pingle, the chief U.S. economist at UBS, to break down the strong data we've seen so far this week. And Lisa, more data still to come later this morning. You know, here's the issue, and, and I've really been confused about this this week. What data is going to matter? How do we translate it? Is it going to be Procter & Gamble showing that they can raise prices? Is it the fact that NASDAQ 100 companies are no longer mentioning recession? They're all mentioning artificial intelligence and the boom that it's going to create for their earnings and pricing power. Or are we going to look at these lagging indicators that have proved faulty in the past, right? I mean, at what point, what is the actual indicator that's going to give us a sense of what direction central banks are going to move in? You get a break in the Goldilocks story. Max Kentner of HSBC has been tremendous, hasn't he, over he the has. last 18 months? And Max talks about that Goldilocks moment where the economy's not too hot. It's just right, just encouraging this idea of a soft landing. But to Torsten Slock's point this morning at Apollo, for markets to get that ultimate Nirvana outcome, you don't want a re-acceleration. You don't want a re-acceleration. And we're seeing in certain parts of this economy a re-acceleration. The housing market, to me, is the key right now sure. also, because you do see a bottoming out and a reacceleration in that area. If that is the leading indicator in terms of interest rate sensitive sectors, what's that saying about supply and demand, about price tolerance, about the efficaciousness of the idea of a 7% mortgage rate? Nah, who cares if no one's paying it? We've got to talk about this FX market as well. Jane Foley of Rabobank joining us in about five minutes' time. Really looking forward to catching up with Jane after the moves we've seen from the Bank of Japan this week together with the ECB and the Federal Reserve to the heart of foreign exchange very shortly from New York City. Good morning. They don't think they've beaten disinflation. They don't think they've got growth. You know, they, they have 
They've moved up short-term inflation forecast left along what long-term so, ones. So was this not accept towards normalization then? As, as no, he said, I, it was, wasn't. It, it isn't really. Well, it, it's an indication that they know that the yield curve control is a bad policy that needs to go. Um, and it's an indication that they're, you know, they're cognizant of the fact that actually the economy is doing better than it was. It'll take months to get the next move. Ultimately, yield curve control is a terrible policy. What well said Kit Jukes, the head of FX strategy over at SogChain, catching up with Danny Berger on Bloomberg, the early edition, a little bit earlier on this morning. Looking at the FX market, Dolly Yen is lower for five consecutive sessions every day so far this week. Yen strength against the US dollar. On the week, that currency pair is negative about one5 85%. So tons of yen strength out there off the back of this move from the BOJ, loosening its grip on bond yields. Jane Foley of Rabobank saying this, that the BOJ tweaked YCC in, quote, a very cautious way. As expected, the BOJ raised its 2023 inflation forecast, but there was no upward revision to core CPI in 24 or 25. Therein lies the reason for continued caution from the Bank of Japan. If further progress is made in reviving domestically driven inflation, the BOJ will act again but they are clearly in no rush. So, Jane, we've got to start with that question. Lisa's asked it a few times, and Danny Berger asked it again this morning. And, Jane, thanks for being with us. Is this the starting gun on tightening or just setting up policy to keep things a little bit more sustainable and easier for longer? You know, the starting gun uh, really reminds me of the, 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 the tortoise and the hare, and I think the Jap Bank of Japan really is the tortoise and in this race. It is going to be in no rush. And, and this is, you know, backing away from yield curve con control because it can be a nuisance sort of policy. It can push policymakers into corners. And we had this in December when, when the Bank of Japan, you know, made an adjustment to the to the range for the 10-year yield and said it was an adjustment. Now, clearly, we can see those distortions. You know, you have uh, the possibility where you have maybe five-year yield, seven-year yields rising above the 10-year yield. That's not what they want to signal. So they had to raise the parameters. And and really, I think this there's, there's something about what's happened today, which is the same. You know, they, they want to take themselves away from being pushed into a corner by market conditions and, and hence the loosening. But on the other hand, you know, if you read through a lot of the rhetoric from some of the Bank of Japan uh, policymakers, some of them are, are clearly seeing these signs that inflation condi uh, uh, conditions are just beginning to normalize. And I would say perhaps, you know, the real piece of, of juicy news from, from Japan, you know, this week is that the government looks likely to, to be recommending another hike in the minimum wages. That would be a 4% hike. There was already, you know, a really big rise this year. So if that 4% goes through, that is your, your wheels in motion of domestically generated inflation. That's what they want to see. That's the sort of news that we really ought to be re uh, reacting to. So Jane, that long term forecast for inflation that comes from the Bank of Japan, should I view that as an honest view on where they think inflation will be, or just a signal to the market for where they want the market to believe policy will be? Well, the government came out with a pretty similar forecast for, for core CPI. I think it was 1.5% for the next fiscal year, uh, stripping out you know, some of the base effects because there have been some energy-related subsidies, for instance. So, again, in the government, the Bank of Japan, lots of economists are on the same page here. They, they think inflation next year will be lower than this year. Um, and that is why they've got to be cautious, because you've got to remember uh, a lot of the inflation that we are seeing, you know, people are saying, oh, you know, uh, Bank of Japan or Japanese inflation on the headline is, is, is firmer than in the US. Maybe they should be tightening. But that is really misleading, because a lot of the inflation in that particular print is imported prices. Now, imported prices are not domestically driven. That's what they want to see. They, it's the opposite, really, to, to Europe, to, to, to the Bank of England, to, to the US. They want to see this wage price spiral, getting themselves up to sustained inflation around about 2%. We're on that road, but they're not quite there yet. Is it a coincidence, Jane, that the Bank of Japan's tweak, I should say, comes after a real shift from both the Fed and the ECB moving away from forward guidance and away from committing to further rate hikes? Well, you know, I think the moving away from forward guidance sort of reflects the fact that the committees within those central banks are perhaps um, there's there's bigger gaps between the, the, the doves and the hawks because if everyone was on the same page, it's obviously easier to give forward guidance. But when you have this more diverse range of opinions, you can't really do that. And I think that's probably true of the Bank of Japan as well. I think there is a range of opinions within the Bank of Japan. If you read through some of their rhetoric, uh, some of those policymakers are perhaps more ready to act on policy than than others. But 
But, you know, a, a, a caution has always prevailed uh, through the Bank of Japan because of its history, because of its history with de deflation and, and disinflation. Uh, and I think that is still here. And I think that's very evident in the in the commentary this morning uh, from the Bank of Japan governor. It hasn't just been the Bank of Japan that's been causing some waves. This week, there seems to be a feeling that both the Fed and the ECB may be done with rate hikes, which calls into question whether the ECB actually will end up hiking further than the Fed this year, which was the consensus heading into 2023. What's your view on this? Do we have to rethink this, that maybe both are at their peak and their the rate hiking cycle over in Europe isn't going to be as as long as many people thought it might be. Yeah, you know, we're, we're coming down on, on the view that uh, they may pause in September, that, that they, they may not be any more moves from, from the ECB. You know, some of the commentary from uh, some of the officials from the ECB in the last couple of weeks, you know, has been mixed. Uh, but there have been some comments indicating that perhaps core inflation could be plateauing, because obviously that's the focus for, for Europe. You know, that this, this core inflation, the stickiness there. But if we look at some of the economic data, for instance, those PMIs that we had for Europe at the start of the week, they were really quite worrying. If we saw, you know, that the credit survey from the ECB too this week, well, that showed that, that, that the higher interest rates are clearly impacting. So uh, there are, you know, recession is hanging above Europe. Germany, of course, already in, in recession. Recession risks are really very real. And, and that may give the ECB cause for constraint in September and, and pause policy. So we're, we're, we are data dependent. We have to make up, you know, our minds on that according to the data. But there is certainly a risk that the market is going into the possibility of a pause in September whilst it's long, the euro. And that's really important because I think positioning here is going to be adjusted. And I, I think the market has has got very long the euro and anticipated with a very high hawkish ECB. And, and that might have been, you know, overdone. Oh, favourite trades. Let's wrap up. Jane, downside on the euro. What is it? Well, you know, we've had, you know, for, for a while now, uh, a three-month forecast for Eurodollar at, at 108. Um, you know, a, a, a few weeks ago, I think people, you know, wouldn't have agreed with that. I think now maybe people are coming around to that. Uh, the, the market is very long the euro, and I think it's increasingly difficult to see that situation being justified. Jane, thank you for getting on board with the programme this morning, following that breaking news from the Bank of Japan. Appreciate it. Jane Foley of Rabobank responding to the latest headlines out of the BOJ and the week that was the Federal Reserve, the ECB, with a focus on Europe. Here's a focus on America. Andrew Hollenhorst over at City, writing this just moments ago, just echoing what he's been talking about for a number of weeks now. Strong growth and softer inflation look like a soft landing, but we doubt the Goldilocks conditions, Lisa, can last for more than a couple of months. It's that summer sweet spot commentary all over again. And how you interpret it depends really on who you are and where you're coming from, what your longer term framework is. Andrew Hollenhorst seeing a pickup in uh, in inflation, pointing to the employment cost in, uh, in index, saying that it will come out probably in about a half an hour now, saying that labor costs are just rising too quickly to get to some sort of immaculate disinflation. Again, OK, so if we get an ECI, if we get a surprise to the upside, does the market sell off? Is that a huge market mover in an increasingly data-dependent Fed? Current output numbers, current labour market figures, inconsistent with a return to 2%. Most people assume something's got to give. Or the Fed just tolerates something higher, right, and just pushes out the timeline to, to get back towards that 2% line of the sand. My theory that is very subtle and unspoken, so this is going to be sure. the first. I think people still believe in the immaculate disinflation. People still believe in the uh, pandemic effects that are going to shake themselves out have just taken a really long time. And so they're expecting the year-over-year -year comps to just come down and to return to a low inflation, low growth world because of aging populations and because of the overhang of debt. And that's a presiding sort of sentiment that is driving this sort of feeling that we're going to get to another place that is very familiar. We'll get there in 2025, according to the chairman. Can you imagine if back in 2020, 21 when they were playing the transitory game that they said transitory is four years we'll be back there in 2025 and for that reason we see no rush no reason to to hike rates aggressively because there are some people who believe that the tightening cycle of the last 12 months hasn't even bitten yet that the deceleration we've had in inflation has nothing to do with what we've seen from the Federal Reserve that it's just simply the year-over-year -year comps and this is the uh, disinflation post-pandemic key to watch the University of Michigan sentiment survey, which I know you love, but in particular, the longer term expectations of inflation, and not just this survey, but in general, the longer it takes, is that when you start to see inflation expectations creep up in the market and among consumers? I just want them to call me.
That's it. Public service announcement. If you are on the I University of Michigan on polling center, the other end of the questions. Call one, Mr. Jonathan Farrow, with Where his do you Tide see Pods. Long-term inflation stacked up in a perfect. Neat I just line. want to contribute to the survey. I want to be one of the 600. Isn't it a minimum of five? <laughs> is it 500 or 600 people? You call? should say, I believe inflation is going to be 3.1269. No, I'd go with a crazy number. <laughs> That's why they're not going to call you. Yeah. <laughs>we should do what the Europeans do. Vacation for a month. Didn't you feel that from the guard yesterday? It was like, <laughs> we're done and we'll see you after the summer. I love this. You're not even subtle about it. You're lobbying no. the central bankers, basically. Why even show up to anything? Shut the market for mm. like 30 days. Everyone goes away for August. Beautiful thing. From New York City this morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's my reason and my purpose in life in New York City. It's just to convert America to the European view. How's it going? On vacation. It's going really well. Where's TK? Exactly. I was about to say. TK's on point. vacation. Mm. There you go. Alongside Lisa Bravitz, I'm Jonathan Farrow. Your equity market on the S&P 500 positive by 0.5%. Wrapping up a monster week of central bank decisions and earnings as well. And a little bit of breaking news from a central bank where a week or so ago we didn't expect it to come from. The BOJ, Lisa. They uh, tweaked their policy to allow some flexibility in the upward limit of the band, allowing 10-year uh, treasuries to, or 10-year uh, JGBs, rather, to uh, trade at a, a slightly higher yield. I should say trade in quotes, because it's unclear who's trading them. But here's the question. <laughs> How long can we see a calm in markets that uh, it, yesterday seemed a bit jittery on the heels of rumors of this, but the actual delivery of it has really landed with this incredible finesse? You know what? A journalist should actually do that. Go find that one person. 100%. That traded BOJs. JGBs like a week ago. I was actually thinking you know? about that. Maybe they could call the three people who actually trade JGBs. Who, who trade with the BOJ. Exactly. And just say to them, OK, what are, what's the what's the word? What are you, what are you going to do with this? What's your interpretation? Because that predicted half everything. the market. At least. Half the market. We've sort of lost perspective on what's happened over the last 10 years. And you wrote about it extensively. We have a central bank that owns half of the government bond market in Japan, who has set a limit for how high yields can go, which essentially is setting a limit on borrowing costs for the Japanese government at 0.5 percent. And they've come out this morning and we're talking about it as breaking news. Just reset the conversation. Imagine someone's tuned in to this program for the first time ever. Welcome. And you're trying to explain to them that this country exists, a developed country, that is buying pretty much all of the JGBs, all of the government bonds, and capping interest rates at 0.5%. And we're sitting here and saying it's news that they might tolerate maybe a breach of that level and perhaps come in when it gets to 1%. Right. And that's like this monster move because relative to the last 10 years, apparently that's introducing just this little bit of market discipline back to the Japanese government bond market. To take it even a step further, they've also been buying stocks through the ETF purchases. So it's not just bonds. They've owned an entire market. So why should we care? Well, for a number of years, people said if they abandon this on the heels of inflation that, that Japan is seeing as well, that could disrupt all of markets and send yields in developed markets surging higher as people move back to the Japanese market and buy JGBs. What we've seen this morning on the heels of this tiny maybe move, maybe not, they're saying it's not a move, we're seeing calm and some people are saying this might give them the freedom to go even further. Do you want some good news out of Germany? Of course. It's not the growth story, it's the inflation story and this is what sounds like good news in Germany these days, 6.5% CPI. That's a downside surprise by the way, month on month and on year over year. EU harmonised year over year, 6.5% CPI, Lisa, out of Germany. 
I can just hear the cheering. I mean, great. It's good. It came a little bit in below expectations. Although, if you take a look at consumer prices in line, 0.3% month over month, as you were saying. So, are we seeing victory here that basically a slowdown in economic growth does lead necessarily to a slowdown in inflation? Or does this just give you a sense that this is, I don't want to say the sick dog of Europe, but right now, kind of the economy that's doing the, the, the worst among all of them? Describe the dynamic. 0% growth, 6.5% inflation. What is it called? Stagflation. Right. Did that come up in the news conference yesterday at the ECB? Did not, no. Why not? Partly because it's Germany, so she's not going to address a specific nation. But you're right. Why can't you say how difficult is it for you at a time where Germany is in stagflation to be creating a policy that also deals with a real growth picture and inflation in both France and Spain? Just totally obsessed with the next move. I, I was really disappointed with the news conference of both the Federal Reserve and of the ECB, the obsession with September, just the absolute obsession with September. Because many of the questions in those news conferences are asked with the purpose of trying to get some headline that moves markets. And you can see every individual in there trying to achieve it. So they consistently ask about September. It's a great point, rather than try to understand the theory that they're following. Totally. In order to decide whether or not they need to further rate hikes. And can I just say, Mike McKee's the exception he always is. 100%. Because Mike's a great friend of ours. Steve Chevron joins us now, head of multi asset solutions at Federated Hermes. Steve, wonderful to catch up with you. You mentioned the pain trade in this equity market may well be a higher equity market. Just walk us through it, Steve. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's been the thesis that we started with in January when we went back overweight, which was that, look, if even if recession risks do materialize at some point, and that's still an open question, it, it's not today and tomorrow doesn't look good, John. I mean, you look out, if you're still in a position of tight labor markets, inflation that's sticky, a Fed that, you know, at best is maybe pausing, um, may still be in the hike cycle. We'll see what September and November bring but is certainly not anywhere near you know, a place where they're cutting. Historically, that's not an environment where you have big equity sell-offs. If you look, Fed pauses are, are, are really good for equity markets. 15% returns on average, 20% max rallies, drawdowns that are relatively small. And so I, I think that you're in this scenario, and, and I heard you mention in the prior segment this idea of a, you know, a kind of summer window. I don't think it's a summer window. I, I think this goes higher for longer, and I'm talking about equity markets right now. So we see upside through the old highs, even if storm clouds do eventually you know, materialize, but we don't think it's, it's soon. So, Steve, upside where? Because people are willing mm -hmm. or at least want to shift away from the tech winners. They want to think about maybe the things that are left behind, cyclicals, banks, energy, take your pick. Steve, how are you thinking about that? Yeah. So again, if you look at both Fed pauses and then even once you get into Fed cuts, cyclicals tend to do better um, than, than your kind of defensive growth names. Um, also, a 27 times multiple for the Russell 1000 value. That's hard for us to, to kind of just hold our nose and buy. So what we're buying is everything else, pretty much. So we've been overweight value, particularly cyclicals and the defensive dividend payers, a little bit as a hedge. And then our newest buying has been in small cap growth. The idea is, is that it entered its sell off a year before. Those names are still down 20% on a two year basis. And while valuations look high on an absolute basis relative to where they were two years ago, we think they're attractive. So if there's any disruption to the kind of big tech and growth names, it's going to be those smaller companies we think that emerge. And we just think that offers a much better kind of upside scenario. So it's really cyclicals. Yes, a little bit of those defensive dividend payers, but then also the small cap growth where we think there's some better opportunities. I want to point to something that Torsten Slock wrote that John was talking about earlier of Apollo, uh, where he wrote, for markets to continue to trade higher, the soft landing must be a soft landing, not a reacceleration. And he's speaking, of course, about inflation. How much does your bullish call hinge on inflation not reaccelerating and continuing to go down? Yeah. So, you know, in the list of things that you need to watch, uh, I'd put that in there. You know, you've gotten the housing market uh, and home prices have shown some signs of reacceleration. I know we've all seen some of the labor deals that have come through. We're watching wages. Um, you know, our expectation is that you will see some reacceleration in, in at least a headline number in the back half of the year. That's just math, Lisa. I mean, your, your toughest comps or your easiest comps, depending on how you want to think about it. We're really in the first half of last year. As you get to the back half, just the base effect should take you up. So we still have a, a 3.9% core CPI forecast for this year. If it was materially higher than that, 
and we're talking about a Fed then that is forced into, you know, much more aggressive policy action, again, that could have some disruption. But if you look, there has never been a market in the last 40 years, an S&P 500, that was negative during the hike cycle. There was never a market except for one that was negative during the pause cycle. Um, and so it really is once that economic data has deteriorated and you're in a cut cycle that you start to worry about those big downsides. But it's hard to see us in that scenario in 23. And that's the story that if you're a soft landing person or you're or you're someone who sees a, a kind of new bullish trend here, being overweight equities obviously makes sense, even if you're someone that's cautious, though. The historical track record suggests that for some time, and not a very short period of time, you probably still have upside risk, you know, at least through the old highs. When do you know it's gone, Steve, the upside uh, risk or the upside potential for some of the risk assets? Yeah, I think what you watch and what we're watching are going to be spreads. You know, spreads are one. When you start to see spreads move up, I think you need to see a little bit more deterioration in uh, uh, initial jobless claims. You know, you've got to at least get to that 300,000 level before you can start to really think about a material deceleration in the labor force. You know, the unemployment rate would need to kind of creep up on the back of that. The yield curve, not just being inverted, but starting to re-steepen would be a sign. Um, you know, if you start seeing that yield curve get back towards zero, historically, that's a sign that that's starting to happen. Uh, bond yields that are falling. Y y you get the theme here. Those are all the things that I think the most bearish folks thought would be happening already. And, and granted, even though we saw a first half rally, I might have expected to see more progress in, in that direction so far this year, but it hasn't happened. And so until it does, you've got to stick with the regime that you're in. Stick with it. Steve, that's the message. Thank you, sir. Steve yep. Chevron of Federated Hermes on this sweet spot of the market that he thinks can last a whole lot longer than many others do. This just in from the Bank of England. Here's one. The Court of the Bank of England is pleased to announce that Dr. Ben Bernanke has agreed to lead a review into the bank's forecasting and related processes during times of significant uncertainty. Lisa, I think this is the Bank of England basically undergoing a review after getting the inflation call so wrong. And they're not alone, of course, but interested to see a central bank conduct this kind of review and getting someone on the outside like Ben Bernanke to come in trying to get the credibility and to retain the uh, confidence of its independence at a time when a lot of people are questioning how some of these central banks could get things so wrong. I do wonder who's next, right? Could you see the Fed getting some sort of external board of former Bank of England members to discuss what they potentially could have gotten wrong with transitory inflation? Sure. I think we need a big committee, don't we, with the people who got it right for a start. I'm not sure that was Ben Bernanke. <laughs> There's, there is that, too. Right? Couldn't yeah. they have tapped someone on the shoulder that, like, got it right? Well, okay. who did? Mohamed al -Arian. Okay, that's true. I Larry thought you Summers. meant central bankers. Yes, that's no, true. No, I mean, you can pick yeah, an yeah. outside external economist yeah, yeah. Who, who, like, it's got true. it right and come in and have a chat. <laughs> it's one for another day. From New York City, welcome to the program. Your equity market positive on the S&P 500. On the Nasdaq as well, on the S&P positive by 0.56%. Jonathan Pingler, UBS, coming up very shortly following the latest U.S. economic data. The employment cost index is just around the corner. But, Lisa, don't, don't you agree that if you're going to tap someone to do a review, tap the person or people who got the call right on inflation? And what went into their forecast, their thinking? What process did they go through that enabled them to come up with a completely different view to the consensus on your committee? Mohamed el if you're watching right now, if you would like to be tapped on the shoulder, well, please let us know. I'm not going to speak for <laughs> I'm Mohammed. just kidding. Just, yes, no, I understand. You want that external influence to come in. I think there's something to be said about that. But then you tap sort of that establishment figure that was very much with the consensus on where inflation was going to be. It's an important point. How do you gain credibility at a time where people are worried about groupthink? in some of the central banking institutions, where there is a feeling that everyone needs to get on the same page. And if they do have a different view, they're often pilloried in public opinion in the economics profession. So how do you get the sense in the public that this is an independent body, one that does have the credibility of independent thought, not just that groupthink? Bloomberg subscriber just moments ago, so this is not my view, it's theirs. The bloke who printed the money to cause inflation to review the problems caused by printing the money that caused inflation. <laughs> That's well, one view. Yeah. Other people might push back, of course. Henry de Trey's of Vader Partners in Washington, up next.
Pierre Pell is pretty confusing. Uh, he wanted to re uh, assert very strongly that every decision, is, uh, every meeting is live, that every meeting is made based on the data. Uh, but in fact, there, there seemed to be guiding us to a slower pace of policy. That sounds like a committee that is number one, divided, uh, and number two, pretty close to the end. Such a thoughtful guy. Vince Reinhardt there, the chief economist and macro strategist at Dreyfus and Mellon on the latest from Chairman Powell and responding to the economic data just yesterday with Lisa following GDP and jobless claims. Later this morning, about 13 minutes away, the Employment Cost Index, the next big one to watch, the ECI, as it's called, labour market pressures. What do they look like? And do we see further deceleration in wage growth, that kind of disinflationary theme that's breathed some life, some oxygen into the soft landing hopes and dreams of this equity market? Your equity market this morning, a lift on the S&P 500, up by 0.56% on the Nasdaq, up by a little bit more. It's been quite a week for the economic data and for the earnings as well. In the bond market, yields lower by four basis points, 395.26. Yields lower on a day that things have been shaken up just a little bit, the BOJ. But as we've re repeated this morning a few times, Lisa, this because we had the strong lead from Nikkei's reporting about what would probably come this morning from the Bank of Japan. And that lead was a bit more aggressive than the actual move itself. But as you've mentioned several times today, it's still too early to write the book on what this looks like because it's also too early to understand what exactly they're going to be doing. The, the proof is in the pudding of how this stuff trades, if it trades, but whether it actually does end up with, with the yields going materially above the band. You say if it trades, and I think it's worth just sort of fleshing that out just a little bit. There okay. are days in the Japanese government bond market, Correct. market, a term we use loosely here, where nothing trades, where the Japanese 10-year does not trade at all. Well, and this is the conundrum. Why trade something and make a bet when you could have a whale that will come and crush you and will decide, I don't like that. That doesn't work for me. Boom, I'm going to snuff that out. And that really is the reason why we might not even get that big of a move because it's unclear exactly how far this bait of Japan well, will actually do. Where's the line in the sand? Is it at 60 basis points? Is it up closer to 1%? And I guess maybe we'll find out. Joining us now, down in Washington, Henrietta Trace, the Director of Economic Policy Research at Vader Partners. Henrietta, wonderful to hear from you, to have you on the programme. You know the story of the week. It's been about the age of Washington, D.C. What is anyone going to do about it, if anything at all? Right. I mean, unfortunately, I don't think it's a particularly new story. We've experienced this as far back as I can remember, and certainly before then. Um, I think one of the things investors are really trying to get a handle on right now is, you know, if there is a vacancy, how fast is the seat filled? What does this have any immediate impact on? Um, are we still going to see legislation push through as we get into September? Um, and I would point to the Appropriations Committee, which in the Senate has, you know, 51-49 split, as bipartisan as you can get. And they have pushed all 12 appropriations bills out of the committee for the first time since 2018. Um, so I think that even split is weirdly helping in the Senate at this point. Um, and if a few members uh, are no longer in office and they will be replaced with members of their same party, you will keep that same sort of status quo of a very slim Democratic majority, a uh, Republican minority. Um, and the biggest change would just be in sort of directional leadership since we are talking about the minority leader, Mitch McConnell, who has been the leader of the Republican Party for the longest uh, of any Republican serving in that role. So I think the leadership direction is also really interesting. Is he continuing to, you know, give Speaker McCarthy free reign? Um, would leadership continue to support Tim Scott for president over Donald Trump? Those leadership decisions for the party at whole, which are so different in the Senate versus, say, the House or even the Republican Party um, far right fringes or the support of President Trump, those supporters. It's a market difference. And I think whoever replaced uh, McConnell, if he needed to be uh, out of office, would be someone who would try to continue those things, but it'd be difficult because uh, McConnell has really done an, uh, a differentiated job on that run. How are you expecting this issue to shape the campaign in the next 18 months, particularly for the Republicans next month in that first debate when someone like Nikki Haley has already put this out there and asked for so-called competency tests from leaders in Washington? You know, it's not the first time we've seen somebody ask for a competency test for leaders in Washington. Um, you know, you could even say competency tests for voters. Uh, I don't think any of that is going to move. The threshold for support is just way too high. Um, so you'll hear that argument. Uh, unfortunately, it does span both political parties. 
Um, you do have very older, uh, elderly leaders in both sides. So it somewhat negates the argument since everybody is doing it. So uh, obviously it's a frequent refrain we hear against President Biden um, or really many of the leaders. Uh, and both sides of the aisle, Republicans and Democrats, have very old uh, members in the House and the Senate. There are a lot of people who say uh, one reason this has persisted is because voters don't care and they continue to vote for people regardless and they take a priority on the idea of name recognition and uh, years of service over a new entrant. What is the impact of that on younger voters? Are we seeing any sort of shifts there or is it pretty much status quo? You know, it really is much more uh, obvious to see the changes based off of what a candidate votes for, not their age. And we could use the last election as an example. Um, name recognition is humongous. You know, uh, Chuck Grassley has incredible name recognition in his home state, and it's unlikely that he would ever be defeated if for no other reason than that, despite what he's you know given to his uh, constituents. But I would say that the number one piece that you're looking for is uh, for younger voters is a focus on things like abortion and climate change. And it doesn't matter how old you are if you're able to get those things right. Um, so and then you have President Biden working on student loan forgiveness. You know, that's obviously a youth voter uh, and supported initiative. And that is where Biden gets his support despite his age. So it's really on those three issues, uh, climate change, abortion, uh, and student loan issues, things like that, um, that voters tend to flock to if they are a younger voter. And the older voters would focus more on immigration. Um, the economy is always top focus. Uh, for Democrats and democracy now, uh, democracy actually polls as the second highest important uh, issue for voters across the board right now, which is a really interesting argument. And, um, you know, some in some circles, that's anti-MAGA. In other circles, that's, you know, anti the Biden administration. So those issues are really uh, <laughs> invigorating voters. And really, sorry, I've got to jump in. We're now saying that democracy issues are both anti-MAGA and anti-Biden. Can you explain that? How is democracy I... anti one party or the other? <laughs> and both. Sure. It's a it's a morning consult morning consult poll that they do like every week. It's fascinating to watch the trends, and that's what uh, I focus on a lot. And the economy is persistently the number one issue, right? Everybody always says that. Then the second issue is this vague sort of democracy. Um, and I, I want to apologize. I think it's actually a Quinnipiac poll that that does that. So democracy, um, the you know the value of your vote. The ability that you have to go vote, you know, all issues, all issues that Donald Trump railed against, uh, both before and after his election, things like mail in balloting. Those are all sort of democracy issues that you could have an issue with the Democratic Party on. And then on the far on, on the left, you look at things like the insurrection, the, um, you know, the special investigations that are occurring right now, the indictment of President Trump today is going to be on election issues and democracy. Did he try to take away the rights of American voters to actually vote? Did he try to nullify their votes with uh, Vice President Pence, et cetera? So it, both sides of the aisle have a way to say that democracy is critical to them. Uh, and it polls as number two in some polls. Amazing. The issues. Henrietta, yeah. thank you. Henrietta Trace there of Vader Partners. Amazing, isn't it? How divided things are it's across things like that. Tribal politics. That's yep. what this has become. And the other side is destroying the fabric of the nation. That has been basically the feeling on both sides. And so what do you get where you can come together and actually talk about issues and things that uh, people can agree on and have common ground? That would be nice, wouldn't it? It would be really nice, yeah, but it politics, wouldn't really unfortunately, sell in the same kind of way. No, that's not politics exactly. right now. Or Coming up, there'll be plenty of that on the open in about 35 <laughs> minutes, just people throwing stuff at each other about markets. <laughs> Monica Defend of Amundi. Jim Karen and Morgan Stanley, very aggressive chap. <laughs> Cameron Dawson of UH Wealth. Well. Oh, yeah. All of a that and more. Tribalized markets. That's a beautiful line. Mm. Tribalized markets on Bloomberg TV and radio. <laughs> From New York, equities positive. We're almost there. You can hear it in my voice, can't you? No. We're a few hours away mm. from the weekend. This is Bloomberg.
Just moments away from a slew of U.S. economic data, including the employment cost index, a sense of just how hot or perhaps cooling the U.S. labor market is and how much wages are rising, as well as personal income and spending. Also, the PCE deflator. This is the key metric that the Fed watches to understand the direction of inflation in markets. Uh, not a whole lot of drama. Gains in the equity markets, a bit of a retracement from yields going higher yesterday on the heels of that Nikkei report uh, talking about the Bank of Japan eliminating yield curve control. Didn't quite do that. We've been talking about that this morning. Right now, the data is coming in. We're joined by um, Michael McKee of Bloomberg. Mike, what do you see? Well, we got some big numbers this morning that are important. We've got the employment cost index coming in a little bit lighter than anticipated and down from the prior quarter. It comes in at 1% uh, down from 1.2% in the first quarter, which would be good news for the Fed. We'll get the breakdown on that and see what the wage component was in just a moment. Personal income rises 3 tenths. That's a little less than last month's four tenths and down from the five uh, tenths, the half a percent that was anticipated. Actually, uh, the May number was revised up to half a percent. So uh, slowing there, but we did see that in the overall GDP numbers. Uh, spending comes in at, uh, as I said, uh, half a percent. Uh, real personal spending at four tenths. So uh, not a huge inflation effect. And then those PCE numbers that uh, everybody from Lisa to Jay Powell are watching. The deflator comes in, uh, the headline number comes in at two-tenths of a percent. That's a little bit faster than last month, but this what, it was what was forecast. And so we, on a year-over-year -year basis, headline PCE is three percent. The core is a two percent, a two-tenths gain. So that comes in at 4.1 percent, and that's uh, lower than anticipated and certainly lower than 4.6 percent last month. So, Lisa, we've got uh, basically the same story we've had for much of this week, the data come in in line kind of with what the Fed wants, um, you know, not all perfect, but better than it has been. Suggesting a slowdown in inflation while retaining some of the strength of consumer spending and growth. The market reaction isn't that significant based on the trend that this just continues. Uh, stocks just edge slightly higher than NASDAQ, leading the way up more than 1 percent. You can see two-year yields just edge slightly lower in response to this, uh, currently at 4.85 percent. You could see uh, the euro dollar, which has been moving all over the place, and there had been a bit of dollar strength, and then people reassessing. Uh, we don't see a huge shift there, a euro strength dollar weakness that continues with a 0.4 percent gain. Mike, when I'm looking through these numbers, it does seem to confirm this Goldilocks scenario of slowing growth, slowing inflation, but still robust consumer spending. How reliable, how significant is this data showing an upside surprise of personal spending, even as incomes fall off just a touch? Well, it's kind of what the story we've been seeing. Uh, it is interesting that it, we get get a little bit of an upside uh, surprise in personal spending because the GDP numbers suggested consumer spending had fallen off. So maybe that was weakness in April and May and June comes in better, which sets you up uh, for a little bit better spending going into this third quarter. Uh, and obviously, we've got back to school coming up, which will be an important measure for retailers. The uh, other numbers that come in better than expected, uh, they're not going to have a huge impact right now because we get a lot of data between now and the next Fed meeting, but it does show that things are going in the right direction. And so maybe uh, Jay Powell gets the board of governors together and they'll go out for happy hour today or something. <laughs> well, or they just go take August off, as uh, Jonathan has been talking about all morning. Mike, please stay close. And as you look through the data, uh, we will get more details in just a little bit. We have with us someone who has been at the Fed who might tell us about happy hour after getting good economic reads. Jonathan Pingle, chief U.S. economist at UBS, who is not at happy hour currently sitting at his office. I'm curious from your vantage point, uh, Jonathan, how much conviction you can have in this soft landing narrative when we keep getting data print after data print showing, you know, disinflation, robust growth, this feeling that maybe we will just immaculately get price stability. Yeah, I mean, this, you know, this is certainly good news, but we're still actually a long way from price stability. I mean, I think, um, you know, looking at today's employment cost index data, as you know, as sort of Mike was saying, as well as the core PC deflator, um, you know, the year over year change falling to 4.1% puts the Fed actually within striking distance, two tenths of their sort of full year projection um, for later this year. But even at 4% or the Fed's 3.9 in Q4, 
you're still a ways away from what you would call price stability. So everything looks looks great now. I mean, looking at, you know, Mike was mentioning real spending coming in a little stronger. You know, we'd actually sort of expected the four tenths increase. And he's right. I mean, we ended up revising up our Q3 consumption estimates after retail sales as a result. So this is all good news. And the economy has certainly proved resilient. But they do have this problem that they, you know, we're making progress on inflation, it looks like, but we're not actually at two yet. And there's actually a pretty big gap between now and, and how we're going to get there and a lot of uncertainty. But, you know, at the moment, Lisa, yeah, the data looks good. What's the bigger risk right now that we're wrong about inflation just steadily coming down and we see a re uh, reignition of uh, some of the price increases or that the economy slows down more dramatically and that the strength that we've seen recently it perhaps isn't indicative of the longer term trend? Well, I, I am pretty worried that this economy is going to slow meaningfully in the coming quarters. Um, you know, there are a lot of positives right now, but there are also headwinds. And, and I still kind of agree with Chair Powell that there's still follow through from the monetary policy tightening. Um, I think there's, you know, there's still excess savings that's 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 percolating through and supporting spending, um, you know, and, and some of these forces could diminish. We also have things like student loan repayments coming up. I mean, there's a number of, of headwinds and challenges um, that we're still going to have to face as an economy. But I, I think you've you've nailed the sort of risks on the head, right? Because, you know, everybody, of course, would like to have a soft landing and not have job loss and, and have this 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 continue. But the initial conditions are a little tough. And by initial conditions, I mean, you know, we're starting with a low unemployment rate. You know, even with the ECI at one percent, I mean, I think that's going to be great news at the Fed. Um, take a little bit of the uh, wind out of the you know sails of the more work to do uh, component of the committee, um, but that's still you know a little over it's you know four percent annualized, and Fed kind of needs it to get it down closer to three and a half. So we've got a low unemployment rate, nominal wage inflation that's still a little brisk. If the economy stays strong, you know there is the risk that the Fed might have to hike more and do more work to to get the slowing that they need in the economy. A lot of people, Jonathan, have been talking about how it's been easier to get a disinflationary trend just simply on the year-over-year -year comparison numbers, at least over the past few months. What changes, what areas of the inflation overview are you looking at? Is it housing? Is it car prices? Is it something else that could fuel some sort of strengthening in the inflation reads? Well, I mean, it, it's all of that. I mean, I don't think the details of the inflation data in my career have ever been as looked at as they are today because of how crucial it's been for monetary policy. But when we think about, you know, sort of what's unfolding in the various chunks of the basket, I mean, I think, you know, there, you know, there's people have talked about, you know, super core and, and, and sort of these measures. I mean, I don't want to put a label on it, but when we look at some of the services components that are most linked to uh, wage inflation, uh, many of them also have relatively persistent components. Um, you know, I think we can get comfortable with the goods disinflation and we can see it. And I think, you know, we're watching sort of, you know, OER and rent slow and the CPI data. But, you know, these other services, um, you know, are really sort of what, what, what I think is worth watching for where the improvement could come or, you know, what might reaccelerate um, because of the low unemployment rate. And that's one of the reasons I think, you know, Chair Powell in his press conference, you know, went, went ahead and mentioned the ECI as sort of one important data point they would get between the July and September FOMC meetings. And if you're just joining us now, we did see the ECI, the Employment Cost Index, come in at 1% for the second quarter. Uh, the expectation had been 1.1%. It was down from 1.2%. Personal spending coming in stronger than expected at 0.5%. Uh, personal income coming in soft so people making less and spending more. Michael McKee, you've been digging under the numbers. What do you see? Yeah, let's look under the hood at a couple of things that Jonathan was talking about. The ECI for wages goes down to a 1% gain from a 1.2% gain in the okay, first great, quarter. Uh, and that would be considered reasonably good news. But then when you look under the personal income figures, wages went up six-tenths of a percent in the month of June. Uh, and that is uh, 
uh, up from a half percent. It is actually the highest increase since January. So we have two sort of uh, contrasting views of what wage pressures are doing at the moment. And uh, John mentioned, as uh, we do every time we get an inflation figure, the super core, mm. which is uh, <laughs> Jay Powell's favorite thing. Uh, core services X housing comes in at a two tenths gain uh, to 0.22, if you want to round it out to three figures, and uh, that puts it at a 4.1% per, uh, uh, increase for the year, which is going to be uh, your lowest since uh, basically last August. So things moving in the super core direction, take out housing out of the e equation, and uh, services for the PCE, like the CPI, are down. But uh, the wage number's still healthy, and that suggests consumers can still keep spending. The question is, will the Fed see that as inflationary? Jonathan, as we talk about these numbers, 4.1 percent, down significantly from what it had been from 4.6 percent the previous reading, What's it, when's it enough? Are we heading back toward 2 percent? Or to the conversation that we had with Richard Clarida, are we looking at a 2.5 or something somewhat above the target that the Fed's just going to live with? Well, I, I mean, so this is a this is probably I mean, this is a question they're going to have to answer at some point, I think, next year. Um, at the moment, you know, obviously, the four point one is not enough. Um, I do think it's pretty relevant, though, for um, sort of the meeting by meeting decisions they're going to make going forward. I mean, this I mean, at four point one percent, they're only zero point two percentage points away from their full year um, core inflation projection already in the June data. So th they're clearly making some progress. The other thing they're making progress on is real rates. Um, you know, this is going to widen the gap between the funds rate after the uh, rate hike on Wednesday um, to a level, you know, that hasn't been around since um, 2000, 2007. So, so they are, so they're, they're making progress in terms of restrictiveness, not just because of the rate hikes now, but also because they're making progress um, on inflation. Now, a year from now, you know, let's say inflation is moving down to two and a half percent, they're going to have to make a decision about how hard they push um, to get it back down to 2.0. I mean, I do yeah. think that monetary policymakers would like to actually get it back to 2.0 um, for their credibility to show that they can do it. Um, are they going to really work very hard to? Um, run it at you know 1.8 yeah. so that they can show that they're on both sides. I don't know that that's worth really um, costing a lot of people their jobs, but yeah. um, I do think they're going to leave. You know, if, if they're struggling to get back to their target, I think they probably would leave restrictive policy in place for a while. Jonathan Pingle of UBS, thank you so much uh, for taking the time. If you're just joining the program uh, right now, we are seeing a bit of a rebound in the S&P, in the NASDAQ, the S&P 45.93, up six-tenths of a percent. What we are looking at right now is economic data that's supposed to matter so much more, and still with me is Michael McKee, our Bloomberg Economics correspondent. Which data matters if we have this increasingly data-dependent Fed, an increasingly data-dependent ECB? Okay, well, the market's not moving too much on the heels of this. When, when's it going to matter? Uh, well, it's not going to really matter until you get into September because we have the August data. Well, we've got all the July data yet to come. We start next week with the ISM and the jobs numbers, and then you get the September jobs numbers. Uh, you get August jobs numbers in September, and uh, we get more CPI numbers in August, more PC. CE numbers. The, the Fed's going to have a lot of data between now and then that could change. Right now, the situation looks pretty good, which is why I'm expecting Jay Powell to be buying at the happy hour this afternoon. <laughs> but the um, it, when you look at the inflation numbers, they're moving in the right direction, which is what they want to see. And interestingly enough, and maybe this will have, we'll have to get a breakdown from uh, John Farrell once the markets open up about um, goods, uh, whether we're seeing consumer staples rise or something like that, because goods spending rose faster than services spending, Interesting. according to the government in the month of June. Yeah, well, Hermes earnings came in better Hermes, better than expected because of Birkenbags that were going up at a pretty significant Everything pace. Everything Tom and people, was spending on. Yeah, exactly, um, which I'm saying it like the investment manager. Coming up, we're going to be talking about the real estate market. Uh, Daniel Hale of Realtor.com will be joining us. Michael McKee, thank you so much.
although activity in the housing sector has picked up somewhat, it remains well below levels of a year ago, largely reflecting higher mortgage rates. And higher interest rates and slower output growth also appear to be weighing on business fixed investment. That was the one and only Jay Powell, the chair of the Federal Reserve, speaking at his press conference where he sought to, I guess, achieve strategic ambiguity or just to say as little as possible as he uh, looked toward some sort of free market kind of strategic decision making policy, something like that, basically. We don't know what they're going to do next. Right now in markets, we do know that there's a little bit of a lift following the sell off late yesterday on the heels of a Nikkei report that the Bank of Japan was going to eliminate yield curve control. They didn't exactly do that, but they did make surprise adjustments. Nonetheless, we are seeing uh, S&P futures up six-tenths of a percent, NASDAQ up significantly more than that. You're seeing the euro gain just a touch versus the dollar, 110, dollar weakness pretty much across the board. Ten-year yields retracing some of the gain yesterday, exceeding 4 percent, and uh, at the highest and biggest move going back to September, crude crossing the $80 a barrel uh, on the NYMEX level. Right now, I want to drill into the one area people always say is the caveat to those who say we're seeing immaculate disinflation. The market is right sizing itself and we are going to see prices stabilize. Danielle Hale joins us now, chief economist at Realtor.com. Everyone talks about the housing market as the lone outlier. We saw it bottom out. Some say now we are seeing a reacceleration. Danielle, can we start there? Are you seeing a reacceleration in housing prices and housing demand and housing uh, availability? Yeah, when you look at some of the month to month numbers, you are seeing a bit of a pickup in pricing. And when it comes to demand itself and sales, they're actually still at quite low levels. Um, pending home sales in the most recent data were up month to month 0.3%. So I, I think it's a far cry from a reacceleration. We're sort of roughly flat at low levels, maybe grinding very slowly higher. Um, you know, prices have surprised on the upside because a lot of forecasters were expecting major drops in prices. We were not uh, a group that forecast big declines in prices this year. But I think it's fair to say we are still seeing prices roughly on par or weaker than a year ago. So we're not seeing the big inflationary run up in prices that we had seen over the past few years it's a slow adjustment, but it is adjusting. Well, nonetheless, a lot of people expected pretty significant declines in pricing, given the fact that we see mortgage rates at 7 percent. The logical conclusion was this would be the transmission mechanism for benchmark rates going higher. Is anyone who you see buying a home actually paying 7 percent interest rates? Oh, yeah. Consumers are paying 7 percent interest rates. We are, um, you know, a significant portion of the market is, you know, purchases a home with a mortgage. So it is an important transmission mechanism. But it is important to consider as well that only four to five to, you know, during the pandemic, up to six and a half or so million homes transact every year. The vast majority of homeowners don't move. So they don't actually experience a change in what they're paying each month for housing, unless maybe they choose to refinance. And there were a lot of households that took advantage of low rates during the pandemic to refinance. And so now we've got a significant portion, 65 to 75 percent of the market, that are locked in with mortgage rates below 4 percent. And that creates a very strong disincentive to moving because it raises the financial threshold at which it makes sense to move. In other words, your house has to be a really bad fit for you to decide that the higher costs that you would pay today for a new home are worth moving. Which is one reason why rents have gone up in certain areas or had been going up in some areas disproportionately because people didn't have the inventory to buy. They didn't have the wherewithal to buy at 7 percent mortgage rates. At what point we have seen rents come off just a bit. Do you expect to see a reacceleration in rental costs at a time where the backdrop for the for the sales market hasn't really changed materially? So we don't expect to see a reacceleration in rental costs. I think that that is a little bit different. When you look at um, supply in the rental market, there's a lot of it that is coming. The number of multifamily units that are under construction right now is at an all-time high, and a lot of those are going to be finished and hit the market at a time when we have seen a bit of weakening in rental demand already, and rental prices have started to decline. By our data, we saw a drop from a year ago in both May and June. Now, again, it's somewhat regionalized. We're seeing declines in the West and in the South, the Northeast and the Midwest are faring better, largely due to better economic conditions in the Northeast, better affordability in the Midwest. 
it's interesting to see this pattern reflected in both the rental market and the for sale market. Uh, we also did a, a joint release recently with the Wall Street Journal on the Emerging Housing Markets Index. And again, Midwestern markets really dominated the top of that list. So we're seeing economic fundamentals impact the housing market as we typically do. Um, and that you know that is leading to these nuanced performances in, in the Midwest and the Northeast versus the South and the West. But on the whole, we are seeing rental prices slow. We expect that to continue as we see more supply come online really across the country. So this is a reason why I'm asking. We've been talking about economic indicators, economic data, whether we see inflation decelerate or reaccelerate heading into year end. And a lot of people point to the housing market, the resilience, the fact that it's turned a corner as evidence of new new strengths and new pressure on inflation. Do you buy that argument? I think it's too soon to say that we've totally turned the corner. Even if we've had, it's really that the decline has stopped, but it's not that we're seeing this massive increase. Housing is very seasonal. And I think it's interesting to see people focus so much on month to month changes, which we know can be a bit noisy. I mean, if people were looking at the CPI in the same way, they would say we're already back on target. Because if you, if you annualize the monthly rate of change, the CPI for both uh, headline and core inflation in the last month was back to 2%. But no one is doing that because we know that monthly data can be a bit volatile. I and mean, we have seen some pickup in the housing market because supply remains low, because transactions remain low, and it's hard to see prices fall too much when you've still got a decent amount of demand with respect to supply. But I don't think we're totally out of the woods in the housing market. And I think we're still going to see prices move largely sideways because affordability still isn't there for most households. So if the housing market is a microcosm for the long and variable lags, how long does it take for higher rates to really impact the valuations in a market that a lot of people said was inflated dramatically by low rates? How long does it take in an era of 30-year mortgages? You know, I think it really depends on what happens with the broader economy, because it's not just uh, the the interest rate channel that matters for the housing market, but it matters to the broader economy. The broader economy has managed to surprise and surpass expectations of the last year. The unemployment rate remains quite sound. Uh, wages continue to go up faster than many would have expected, given the huge increase in rates that we've seen overall across the yield curve. So I think as long as you know incomes remain relatively healthy, we'll see the housing market move largely sideways. Uh, so it will just take a long time uh, for those home prices to get back in line with economic fundamentals like income and uh, the share of income that people are putting towards their housing. But make no mistake, right now, people are putting bigger uh, chunks of their income towards housing than they have historically. And that is straining budgets and limiting the number of households that can actually participate in this housing market right now. We're about 36 minutes away from the open, and now it's time for your weather report, where I ask Danielle uh, whether the extreme heat wave has caused a rethink of any of the shift down to the Sun Belt. Have you seen anything? Well, that's interesting. So, uh, you know, as I noted earlier, we have seen better performance in the Midwest and in the Northeast. Um, you know, I think that's more driven by economic fundamentals than any sort of climate relocation. But I think that's an interesting question. And if you look at our cross-market demand data, I will say a lot of people still moving to Florida, but there are also a lot of people relocating from Florida to further, you know, further north into Georgia, into other um, states in the, the southeast, like the Carolinas. So I, I think it's too soon to say whether that's climate driven. But we do know that consumers are interested in climate information. We've got a lot of climate information on the Realtor.com site information on flood risk, information on fire risk, so that consumers can have that information when they're thinking about buying a home and shopping for a home. Um, so I think it is an important consideration, but it's one of many in a market where affordability is still top of mind. I think you know consumers are trying to make the best decision they can with a lot of different information uh, that they're trying to take into account as they're, they're buying or choosing to buy. Danielle Hale of Realtor.com, thank you so much. Have a great weekend uh, as we look forward toward the depths of summer. Coming up at 10 a.m., we do get the University of Michigan sentiment survey, including the 5- to 10-year inflation read. Interesting to see whether, if it does take a really long time to get back to 2 percent, it starts to shift upward at all. The sentiment in the general population, and perhaps not Jonathan Farrow, who hasn't gotten called yet, they can still call him. He might give you a pretty uh, wild number, but call him anyway. Coming up on 
Bloomberg Television and Radio later today, Intel CEO Pat Gelsinger in the 12 o'clock hour. He'll be talking after Intel results came out much better than expected, seeming to have troughed out after several quarters of losses. We're also going to be kicking off with the market open. Jonathan Farrow on Bloomberg Television on Radio Bloomberg Surveillance does continue as we chart toward what we have with increasing data dependence strategic ambiguity, the trifecta of central bankers.